Hello and welcome to the Neurotech SF Hack Night for Thursday, September 23rd, 2021. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're back from a two-week hiatus, start of the school year, holidays, etc. Um, looking forward to chatting with everyone today. We have all kinds of cool news. Um, one of the things that I'm excited about covering is um, ran across a YouTube video showing off the data capabilities of the new HP VR headset with built-in eye tracking. That is really cool. I had not seen that before. Um, it was just kind of like a random, I was watching VR videos and ran across it. And wow, pretty excited to, to share that one. Um, see what you folks think because I, I did find it neat. And also the fact that it's, it's finally here, VR eye tracking. We've been talking about it for years. Um, it's made it. Another cool piece of news is Facebook last few months released a very high precision time card and appliance for timekeeping. So that's kind of cool for neuroscience experiments, lets you set up even finer time control. And uh, there's a nice write up about how they implemented it and what their goals are. So I think that's another cool topic to cover tonight. Additionally, I put together a bunch of the reports from the spicy challenge so that we can kind of look at that EEG data. I've got the individual reports. I've got side-by-side -side reports. We can compare any pairs, like uh, if we want to look at the baselines against the spices or even two baselines, whatever. And finally, we have like multi comparisons so we can look at most of the data set or we can look at all the baselines or all the spicy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's going to be a nice um, evening, which is great. I think there's lots to talk about and, um, yeah, well, this is all really cool stuff. So um, also welcome. It seems like we have some new folks and um, just wanted to say hello. Uh, welcome, Alex, Ibrahim, now and Jack. Um, we've, uh, we're always happy to have new folks and I'm super interested in uh, finding out what about Neurotech X might interest you. So if you would like, I'm happy to you know, invite you on the stage, have you present, introduce yourself, whatever. Some people don't like that, and that's totally cool. Feel free to say hi in the chat, or you can remain mysterious. It's totally up to you. Um, but thank you for joining us. And if you would like to tell us about, you know, what what interests you, great. If not, we can get started with the, uh, the cool stuff. So give everyone a minute and uh, see which way we're leading. Okay, so, but yes, Super wonderful. And if you have any questions at any time, um, please feel free to put them in the chat. If there's any topics you'd like us to cover, let's say you're interested in some particular aspect of neuroscience or EEG or data processing or interpretation, please uh, feel free to let us know so that we can address the topic. I'm super happy to, to talk about anything. And uh, this is just the stuff that I prepared for tonight's call. Uh, it's certainly not meant to be uh, an exclusive list or anything like that. So if there's anything like, hey, I want to talk about Elon Musk, <laughs> uh, please feel free to uh, to ask us, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about Elon. Um, oh, wonderful. Uh, SFSU, congratulations. This is a very, very good school. Um, wonderful. So, yeah, let's... Let's start with the VR stuff, because I think that is that is a very cool topic. And um, I thought it was really neat. So um, this is a video, Ryan was um, you were telling me about there was a high profile VR person and that that's where I think you had gotten the leak from. Uh, was the name of that person uh, Thrill Seeker on YouTube or is that someone else? Excellent, and Amar, I think we will definitely get to that as well. Yes, excellent. All right, so it might have been Thrill Seeker. At any rate, it's one of Thrill Seeker's videos that um, that this that I'm referring to. So I'll skip the audio because you know, listening to a YouTube video through Crowdcast is like. But I'll share the screen. We'll scrub through the. Um, the video and we'll take a look uh, and we're going to have all kinds of cool topics to talk about. Itamar is going to queue us up. So basically what I was thinking is we pool, 
we'll go over the topics, any intros, whatever, and then we'll just dive into all the discussion stuff, kind of like second half or something like that. But if there's anything pressing, let me know. And if if you'd like to ask anything that we're covering, cool. So let's go ahead and share the screen. Great. I'm going to think it should share properly. Now, incidentally, I'm going to go make sure that the YouTube is up and running because we got to check it. Should be fine. But hey. Yep. We're good to go. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, cool. So I'm going to share this. All right. And can you see this video? Oh, I guess I should bring up the chat so that I can see everyone respond. Hey. Oh. Yeah, I'm loading the wrong crowd cat. It's going badly. It's going badly already. I'll, I'll, I'll point this out. Okay. Close the app and pretend that didn't happen. No, I'm not unable to navigate an app. Why do you ask? Okay, so, ah, here we go. This is the one. Cool. And... Now I'm in the chat. All right, look at that. All right, so, um, yep, looks like you can see it. Let's go ahead and show the video. So um, the first part is talking about NVIDIA's VR foveated rendering, um, which is called VRSS. So I had not realized that NVIDIA actually had drivers ready to go that supported foveated rendering. I'm going to spoil the video, but basically he saw no visual difference and no performance difference or potentially it made things worse. So sadly, whatever, whatever we were hoping for from VRSS, I think it's, it's promise is still in front of us, um, which is cool. But yeah, sadly, you can see that ultimately like even though the eye tracker knows where you're looking um it hasn't rendered it in particularly higher quality now this is a topic that interests me um maybe i'm gonna dive into it into a little more detail later but i'm curious about the timing of this because like for 60 fps you're rendering a frame every 16 milliseconds and let's say a video card can do one or two frames of forward rendering so let's say you're out 33 or 45 milliseconds to sample from the eye tracker takes roughly 33 milliseconds. So um, if the game engine has already rendered that stuff, then then I don't see how you can get the performance gain. And then obviously, if you're holding the frames, then you've got quite a bit of delay. So um, I, I think now, obviously, once once the gaze is in a location, subsequent frames can be rendered there. So there's there's going to be just a latency where kind of like the initial fade in. So I wonder if, you know, maybe this is right at the start where the engine needs a few frames to catch up or whether this is just as far as they've got it. But interestingly enough, there is this kind of loop from video card trying to render the frame, sampling the gaze position, updating it and so on. So probably it'll just deal with the fact that the the gaze position is delayed from a few frames ago. I mean, that's probably the most reasonable solution because um, you still get some advantage and, and whatever. But uh, yeah, I guess that means that anytime you're moving your eyes a lot, there's not going to be any benefit here. But um, even when you keep it steady, it's fairly minimal. Okay, check the Crowdcast just because I can't see very well. Cool. Ah, uh, yes. VRSS makes a difference in games to support it. Yeah, well... So far, um, it um, it's fairly minimal in these examples that were shown. Cool, thanks for that info, Ryan. But here is the part that we're all excited for with the Galia and um, this particular device first, which is eye tracking. So uh, pupil size correlates with cognitive load. And that's kind of cool. 
because while cognitive load is sort of a little bit ephemeral, a little bit vague, it still gives you the general idea of what's going on. It's how much processing your brain is doing. In some settings, that's going to be how excited you are. In some settings, that's going to be how immersed you are. In some settings, it might be how scared you are. But whatever it is, it's measuring the intensity of your cognition. So um, this is good info for game designers. And one of the big questions I've had is where exactly API and SDK wise are we? Because it's one thing to have the sensors in the device. It's another thing to have the sensors kind of accessible through some API. And the reason I bring that up is most of these eye tracking devices that are sold don't give you access to a pupil size. They only give you access to gaze location. So I was, I was expecting that with VR, they would give you gaze location because um, that is going to matter for rendering. It's going to matter for interaction, whatever. But I was not sure if the devices put into these would support getting a pupil size measurement. Well, luckily, it turns out that for the HP, it does. And I'm not sure what the status is on other devices, but it does seem like for this one, it supports it. So um, they show you these features, but let's see if I can find the cognitive load portion. And of course, I should have queued up a timestamp. Sorry, I'm going off memory here. Yes, here we go. Cool. So this is the way that they plotted the cognitive load. So the data that they're pulling off of this device is HRV, expression. So that's what this cam is for, right? Um, this is like smiling, frowning, etc. Eye location, and they have nicely blocked out the eyes. A lot of people find staring at eyeballs moving to be kind of creepy. And um, you'll find that most of this eye tracking software kind of tries to hide the fact that, that, that it is very much recording your pupils in infrared. So you'll notice that this photo is kind of cut off and uh, you have these two virtual eyes, but don't, don't be misled. The eye tracker can definitely see your eyes in infrared and um, that's, that's how it works. So it's interesting that whenever this data gets presented to people, you know, those, those, eyes, it's just, it's upsetting to a lot of folks. And so why, uh, why include it? I get that, but I just thought it was definitely something to consider. So it looks like we have a metric, a cognitive metric. I'm not sure if they normalize that from zero to one based on like your measurements lifetime, or they have some kind of range that they've defined, you know, probably three to seven millimeters. That's sort of a standard pupillary size for various tasks. Um, yeah, and give me a second. I'm just going to check if there's any questions in chat. Sorry, I was hoping that um, the iPhone app would let me see the chat, but it is, it lets me see the people in the chat, but not the chat. Yes. Okay. Never mind. I can see the chat now. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. Cool. So um, there is a PPG sensor, mouth tracker, and most importantly, this is your pupil size. So again, it seems like they are abstracting the actual size. Um, when we do the measurements, we typically do raw. The reason that you might abstract um, if you want to be less sensitive to lighting conditions and if you just want to look for shifts. There's a big balance in relative versus absolute data. Let's not get into it right yet and unless people really want to have that discussion. But um, in this case, they've decided to plot relative data. Cool. So yeah, this is the pupil size as this person does a task. Ugh, geez. Uh, that's their mouth um, <laughs> doing gestures. And um, yeah, here is the eye tracking following your eyes. And so, wow. Okay, yep, here is the gaze circle. And okay, here are the pupil plots. So I think this is a very interesting preview of what VR developers are gonna be looking at 
when they have these devices that have these sensors and when they're trying to correlate the gameplay elements that they're including with how people are experiencing them. You'll note that, I don't know the length of this recording, but I'm gonna assume it's like five minutes. One of the things that's interesting is with data this rich, with iData, context gets tricky because you can have two recordings that are five minutes long, but the data will be quite, quite different. Uh, the oscillations will be in different places and so on. So collecting the data is great. I do think as much as you can have context with this, it will richen your ability to interpret. Same thing with heart rate. Why did this person's heart rate goes up? Well, you have the facial expression um, and it, with something like the Galia, you would potentially have electrodermal activity or skin resistance. So yeah, this is, I think this is pretty cool. This is the first in the wild sighting I've seen. This video has 120,000 views, which is definitely a lot for like a typical neuroscience video. So I do think this is the most people that has ever looked at, you know, bio data within a, a VR setting before. Now, then he talks about, I think, the applications and the way that you can have a game that sort of responds to your location and knows what you're looking at. And you can have NPCs that turn around, you know, because you're looking at them, et cetera. But ultimately, I really thought the pupil size was cool. And the fact that they, I don't know if this data is fully freely available or if this was sort of a development example. But if it is available, that is super nice because then it means that one of these VR devices can substitute for a much more expensive medical device or eye tracker. So yeah, you get the person tracking, the directionality and so on. Uh, yes. Hi, all right, welcome. Yes, we are talking about VR and the HP Reverb G2 Omnicept, which happens to include eye tracking, and in particular seems to measure the size of your pupils. And this is a measurement that can be difficult to get with sort of off-the-shelf devices or you know, without a higher price point due to licensing data access, et cetera. But it is really cool that, hey, here is a VR kit and so, you know, they didn't clarify, did this come off a dev kit? And I'm not sure where exactly to see the origin of this footage, but it's definitely gonna be something that I look into, which is, okay, where uh, maybe we need to pick up an HP Reverb G2 and see how, you know, how the data is packaged. There's probably like a developer SDK or API. And I think that would be cool. So yeah, that is a, um, a device that exists today. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Ryan, how about we invite you in just a bit to, to talk about VR, um, maybe right at seven o'clock if that works. Uh, but I would love to have your, your input. Awesome. Awesome. Because I would really, really like you to, to dive into it. Okay, great. So here is the uh, VR stuff. And uh, any questions about VR, why the prospect of having this, these eye trackers built into VR is exciting, or you know, the potential applications from the developer or game designer side uh, are also pretty interesting. So any questions around that, feel free. Um, otherwise, we will probably not even stop sharing. So you know, the inception thing. But yeah, we'll, um, we'll take a look at Facebook's time card, and then we'll take a look at the data, and then, yeah, then it's nothing but chatting. Awesome. Cool. So let's go to the next part, the Facebook time cards. All right. So it's going to be, let's see, oh, the sourcing. I'll just do the entire screen. I think that's going to be easiest. Okay. Cool. So open sourcing a more precise time appliance. Now, this is a pretty lengthy article. I'm gonna go ahead and toss this in the chat um, in just a moment. But basically, uh, here's a write-up posted on August where they really go into detail as to why and how 
Um, they built this PCIe card that's going to give you really, really precise timing. I also thought it'd be interesting to talk about why timing tends to matter in neuroscience experiments and then um, talking about the particulars here. So with this particular time card solution, Facebook decided that they didn't want something proprietary. Um, they wanted GPS-based timing and they wanted to leverage NTP type stuff. So they wanted the reliability of NTP. They wanted um, not to be locked into a particular vendor that had hardware and software vulnerabilities. That's more of a Facebook problem than it is, I think, for most researchers, because ultimately um, you're probably not getting targeted by nation states the same way that Facebook does. And um, of course, you know, they can't, they don't want off the shelf stuff. Again, Facebook problems. So they put together this uh, time appliance and it's a GPS receiver. Yeah. And it works off of offsets. So you get this cool stuff. They have a payload and delivery division between the, the time card. Uh, so yeah, same concept as TCP IP. And um, they wanted tens of nanoseconds and uh, 10 picoseconds of timing. Um, why does this precision matter? Okay, well, let's take a look at P300. That's a classic. We're going to look at some images. Okay. So when you stack P300s, and this plot is actually nice because it's um, it's messy, which is what I was definitely hoping to demonstrate, you will get messy data like this. The trials will generally agree with each other. If you look at the blue, the red, and the black. Um, but the different trials are not quite identical. So if you look at the permutations, you get quite a few variations. So the solution to this is to do, well, one solution to this is to do like 100 or 200 trials and then stack them all together and plot that. Now, the thing that's going to happen is if they're not synchronized in time, you're going to get drift. You're going to get um, horizontal misalignment between the charts and they're going to be completely unreadable. So the reason that a lot of this precision and a lot of this timing is important is so that you can actually average large data sets. And um, on the Neurotech uh, X showcase call last night, there was a really cool demonstration of some psychological presentation software in VR. And the presenter was explaining, okay, so standard psychological batteries, 600 trials. And that's just like for one set of tasks that they're doing, right? So I think it was like six different blocks of 100. If you can imagine averaging 100 trials together on top of each other, you need the timing to be decent to avoid that smearing effect of the, of the data being very hard to interpret. So yeah, the more trials that you need to average together, the more precise that your timing needs to be. So if you're only going to average five or 10 trials, it's okay if, um, if they're a little messy or noisy. But the more observations that you want to include, by necessity, the more it's going to force you to have better precision on the timing of the event, because otherwise it's going to, it's going to affect the, the plots too much. So yeah, it's, um, I think, it's interesting that Facebook ran into a very common problem, you know, for a variety of timing applications, you're, you're looking for some way to, uh, to do that as, as well as you can. And uh, yeah, so that's why we have this super, super, super high precision being interesting to neuroscientists because it, or scientists in general, because it does let you take the amount of data that you're collecting and pooling to a, to a higher amount and that could potentially, you know, let me gain some insights. So yeah, this article definitely drills into all the details of the, the way that they implemented it. And here it is. Here is the Facebook time card. Um, it's a beaut. I can only imagine this in the latest Jay's Two Cents videos. Okay, so here is the time appliance in action. 
and uh, it is task agnostic. Any x86 with a NIC is capable of being turned into a time appliance. So yeah, I do think this is really cool. I could see like a lab putting together one of these. I could see somebody using some of these to help with the precision. So yeah, in their testing, they had plus or minus 40 microseconds throughout a 48 hour period. I will also say that precision can be a little bit of a rabbit hole. Now, maybe it's a rabbit hole that is definitely worth pursuing, but there are so many other aspects that will also come into play. And an uh, example that I can sort of provide is there's a lab in the Bay Area that does EEG collection, and they do focus on making sure that their data is quite well synchronized between the stimulus and the timing and so on. So they're forced to use CRT monitors. And I think Ryan's going to know the reason for this. But CRTs have super, super low latency, uh, about one millisecond. And they also draw the whole screen at once, uh, whereas LCDs do this thing where they start at the top or the bottom and they draw the screen, but it actually takes quite a while for each frame to get rendered, about 15 milliseconds. So there's quite a big difference between LCDs and CRTs. So as you start to do these things, you will, you will get into timestamp precision issues. You will get into monitor latency issues. You will get into time tracking issues. So it's kind of like the, the more you push precision, the more elements that you'll need to be aware of and manage properly to get the level of, of synchronization that you're looking for. But there may very well be some applications where that's worth the trouble, that it's going to allow you to do an analysis that you otherwise wouldn't. And there might be situations where there's no reason or you know, it's just not going to change too much about what's happening. So yeah, I thought it was really cool that this is now open source. You can combine it. You can build your own appliance at Open Time Server. You've got this uh, Git images, hardware, et cetera. So pretty cool. I think um, this does allow you to add a high amount of precision to your experiments if, if you wanted to. Uh, excellent. Yes, absolutely, Ryan. And I think really another thing that I'm super interested in is the multimodal aspect of this. So the more streams you're putting together, uh, let's look at an emotive bit. Um, So we recently have been implementing the Emotibit. By the way, Ryan, good news. We have the Emotibit streaming data. I think we're going to be fully ready by next week so that like we've got it. We got the whole thing like uh, the Emotibit, the, um, the eye tracker and the EEG. But yeah, I, I did think it was cool that we have, you know, GSR EDA, Thermistor, PPG, all that good stuff. Um, so if you look at something like this, you're going to have a bunch of streams and not just that the device has, in this case, these sensors have different sample rates and, um, and Motivate actually just recently changed their clock scheme to go from like the interaction from the Emotibit to the Adafruit. Now their new Emotibits for February are going to include a, a timing chip. So kind of topical right we're, we're talking about this and yet here is you know a single device with eight sensors it started having timing issues between its its data stream and so on so um the more of these you add the more timing synchronization is going to be tricky so then you add eg then you add eye tracking potentially you add um, mouse and keyboard input or vr controller and so on and there is quite a bit so i think that as we scale up the number of sensors in these VR devices, as we get higher precision measurements, heart rate, HRV, but now you have triple PPG sensors. So you can do, you know, the, the green, red, blue measurements. You've got skin conductance. You've got even the person's body temperature and ambient humidity. Pretty cool. So yeah, it's, um, I think precision, with multiple streams is going to be sort of a, a recurring challenge, but it's definitely doable. And it's interesting to see that 
that implementation from Facebook. Beautiful. Okay. So uh, any questions on Facebook, time card, or other cool stuff? I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Take a moment to see how things are going. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. So Itamar had a question about VR. Um, is the VR device can be guided to modify mood? Yeah, absolutely. Um, emotion tracking and responding to player state, player emotion, is one of the big things that developers are hoping to do with this eye tracking VR. So if, if a player is playing Left 4 Dead 2, the only thing we can really measure their stress level off of is the game state. We can look at how many zombies there are. We can look at how much health they have. We can look at how much ammunition they have. But let's say the player has not noticed that their health is really low. Well, they might be completely unconcerned about it. And they're, they're about to find out to their misfortune that uh, their health was low and they didn't know it. Or maybe they, they've only got one bullet left, but they, but they haven't checked the ammo counter in a while. They don't realize that. They think they have all their ammunition as normal. So that creates this interesting mismatch where if you look at the game state, you would say, oh, the player knows that they have low ammunition. But if you have an eye tracker, you can say, did they look at the ammo counter in the last few minutes? Okay, well, if they didn't, they might not know how much ammunition they have. Um, are they behaving like they're aware that they have low ammunition? If they're not, they might not know that they have it. And finally, let's say you get something quite clear in the eye tracker. They look at the ammunition, you realize they only have one bullet left, and then you see this uh, stress response happen. That tells you that the player realized, hey, oh, wow, this is actually, you know, <laughs> the Ralph Simpson's joke, I'm in danger. But uh, they realized, right, oh, crap, I'm, this is not good. Uh, and, and then you get a response out of them. So with that, I think game developers are hoping to use that information to calibrate experiences for the user. So recently with Resident Evil The Village, which is a VR experience, um, it was a, a scary game, but apparently it was very scary to the point that people were, were having slightly traumatic experiences in it. So I think they ended up dialing back some of the intensity of the experience. But I think that's a good example of where that could go. So let's say you've got some threshold for pupil size, expression, skin conductance, whatever. And if you reach that, you realize, hey, this user is in distress. Right? Um, they're not having a good time. They're not enjoying some. They're just, they just feel crummy. Uh, you could have a you could have a, a thing where the game kind of, hey, we're taking a timeout, no big deal, whatever, right? Break the fourth wall. Um, so definitely super cool that the idea is a game developer wants to make a game enjoyable for you. And that enjoyability is kind of this narrow band. At the, at the start of it, the game is boring. Then it's enjoyable in the mid part. And then it's too intense if they, if they overdo it. So developer is kind of aiming for this midpoint where the game is fun, not too boring, not overwhelming. And I think that with these kinds of metrics, facial expression tracking or pupil size, skin conductance, heart rate, you would actually be able to get a sense of is the person enjoying it. And expression in particular, and I'll show um, one second. I'll, uh, show the affectiva thing again. Cool. So here is affectiva, which is basically um, emotion tracking. So they use expression and they have an API and they track like 16 different moods. Um, they do it for cars. They do it for media analytics. I think there's one where like this one, but it requires your camera, which I'm currently using. But yeah, pretty much here you go. This is what it looks like. So you get these, these ratings, expressiveness, attention, brow furrow, disgust, uh, smile, etc. So this plot shows all of them, which is probably a little bit busier than you would have it. 
realistically, you would have one or two maybe things that you're looking for. So let's say we're a mean game designer and we're making a scary game. So we're going to only look at the smile criteria. And anytime we see one, we're going to make sure something bad happens to the player. You know what I mean? It's, it's really interesting how a game developer could nudge your mood and how uh, these things could be positive or, or negative depending on the intended application. So yeah, I do think it's really, really cool, but that is absolutely the goal. That is, that is the hope is that we can interact with people's emotions. Beautiful. Okay. Ah, we have another excellent question. Okay. Multimodal sensing devices like the Motivit, do they have a traditional uh, timekeeping technique in place? It depends. Uh, and I, I know that's the least helpful answer. Um, a lot of devices for price or hardware restrictions cannot include a timing device. So Toby eye trackers from a few years ago did not have a native clock. Uh, they, they relied on the system clock or however you might infer it from the OS. Um, a lot of devices for a variety of reasons just didn't include their own clock. Also, like maybe they weren't sure if anyone needed it. More recently, I would say that it is common to see internal clocks because multimodal is more common. Synchronization issues is, are more common. And I think there is this understanding that this device will be used um, with others. So the emote of it, let's see if I can find the blog. It, this might be a little bit uh, too, but let's see if I can find it quick with like a search, because if I can, I think that would be great. And it was basically for their Kickstarter backers explaining to the, us where they are. Hey, here we go, cool. Update number 10, September 20th. Yeah, so. Where is the tiny bit? Cool. Let's see, I thought they explicitly said that they switched timing, let me see. Ah, here we go. So they added a dedicated ADC for EDA measurements and, uh, oh wait, um, it's about time to log in. Um, this gives a motivit the same super accurate EDA, even if you decide you wanna use a different Adafruit feather. So the original implementation, I guess there was sort of this calibrating and matching it to a very specific Adafruit so that your remote a bit had very precise timing for the Adafruit that it was connected to, uh, which is this uh, wireless Bluetooth uh, connectivity module. So emote a bit now has a 16-bit ADC without having to factory calibrate each Adafruit feather, and it also frees up two extra pins. So I do think that is cool that um, and I think that that's why people do these, these multi runs of hardware. Um, you make your alpha units, which I got like a month ago, you get feedback from the users. Hey, this is bad, whatever. Um, and, uh, the beta run lets you do one rev. And then based on how that goes, you can go into mass production and manufacturing. So it is really interesting that they were able to, as part of that iterative process, identify, Hey, look, this combo functionality of the emotive bit being tied to the Adafruit is a little bit flimsy. It it's, it's creates this dependency where if one device stops working, they're both kind of useless. So I think it's, I think it's a very sound implementation and it's cool that emotive bit identified that it's cool that they responded to it. And I think, I think the, the finished solution will be implemented. So yeah, the, the answer is it really depends on the manufacturer. And maybe if I can be a little bit, um, if I can overstate things a little, I would almost say that the trend seems to be they start with that one and then they, they find all these situations where it creates them problems not to have one. And then eventually they decide that it's worth the 30 cents or so a unit to include one. Um, so yeah, the latest Toby eye trackers, the latest EGs, a lot of them do have their own clocks, but some of them still don't. 
So yeah, uh, pretty cool. Thank you so much for your question. That was awesome. And by the way, thank you also for joining us for the hack night. Okay, um, let's see. Itamar had a question. Um, is there ways to measure short-term versus long-term stress? I believe so. I, I'm somewhat unfamiliar with the topic of sort of chronic stress versus acute stress. Um, but to the extent that the, image, the differences are measurable in imaging, like let's say one presents this way, one presents a little bit differently, you would be able to see it. And I think that um, it's very possible that VR would get used for PTSD type treatments. I do think that that's going to be on the agenda. I, I think people are also using it for desensitivity uh, to fear stimuli. Really interested to hear how that's going. Um, you know, like you're afraid of bees. Okay, you go into VR, you got a bunch of bees flying around type of thing. See if that makes things better. Um, so it's very much being used to to measure the the people's responses to these stimuli. And in the same way that you know, any other emotion, you can look at stress response. You can look at, okay, most people respond to this in the following way, but here's a set of users that responds way more strongly to that stimulus. Um, that tells you something about that person. And it's definitely interesting. So I think VR is going to be widely used in therapeutics. The one example that I am familiar with from Neurotech SF, uh, Karuna Labs with the VR, they were dealing with phantom limb syndrome. So for people that had an amputated limb and still had the experience of feeling that limb, you can go into VR and find ways to sort of improve that. So yeah, they're absolutely using it for psychological improvements. And I think that the stress part will absolutely be a part once the, the sensors, um, once they know how to interpret the sensors properly. Great question. Okay. Um, great question from Ibrahim as well. This is awesome. Thank you all for participating. It's a, a wonderful hack night. Cool. So um, is there a set of metrics to determine how immersed a player is in the VR experience? And how does that skew emotion? There are a few sensors that I think if you stack them together, paint a fairly rich picture. You can still infer a lot from any one sensor. And in this slightly paradoxical way, if you've created an understanding off of the rich data, you can sometimes use just one thing as a proxy because you'll discover that that's quite representative or it's a good example of it. So um, there are kind of two, two aspects into a, a game, which is it's sort of interesting that it immediately you're straddling two fields that had a slightly different approach to things. The cognitive science is off of pupillometry. So that's going to be cognitive load. That's how much your brain is processing. Um, and that's sort of a little bit um, value neutral. It doesn't have a positive or negative component to it. It's simply how engaged you are. Um, are you excited about the thing or are you afraid of the thing? It doesn't distinguish. It's just, just how hard are you working? Um, things like heart rate and respiratory rate gives you a good idea of how your body is consuming resources. And this, this comes up a lot in certain topics, but, um, chess grandmasters consume roughly 6,000 calories during tournaments, just sitting there. Right. So that's, that's really fascinating to consider how much energy usage that is, um, how different that is compared to, to a normal scenario. Um, so things like heart rate and uh, temperature and respiratory rate are actually quite informative. The expression in the mouth is another really, really good sign. That allows you to, to kind of understand, maybe, maybe you doubt the interpretations, but you can tell ultimately whether a player is finding something pleasurable or frightening. Um, do they want to approach or retreat, you know, or to, to put it, in those psychological terms. So that is going to be with skin conductance and expression. That's going to be more the psychological side of experiments. So that's going to be, you know, we show you a hundred photos of 
Meadows, we show you 100 photos of war-torn scenes, and we look at what's different about your body's reaction to these two things. Um, so I think by stacking these two things together, the game developers stand to have access to both how hard the player is working and how they feel about the game. Uh, but it is sort of a mix of measurements. And ultimately, I think your primary ones are going to be pupil size for cognitive load. It's like how, how much thinking processing is the player doing in this game? Uh, EEG for brain state. If you want to kind of get a sense of how their brain is processing that scene, EEG will give you that information. Um, expression will tell you how what emotion is present and skin conductance will tell you the level of stress response and then things like heart rate and uh, respiratory rate will give you an idea of the overall body so i don't know that there's any standard of which metrics get used i, I think it's very much green field no one has really tried collecting or interpreting this data in a gameplay setting before. And um, yeah. OK, excellent follow-up question as well from Ibrahim. Would cognitive load decrease when believability immersion increases? Uh, cognitive load is very interesting. And again, I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> if it sounds like I'm being vague, I'm not. It's a lengthy answer. I'll try to, I'll try to give you um, a little bit of a, of a snippet. You tell me if this is helpful. And, we could go into more detail. Okay, so cognitive load, when when we first started measuring it in the eye trackers, we were really interested, like how does it present? And, and the reality is there's there's a bunch of like um, nuance to it. So in a general sense, cognitive load really kind of lets you know how much processing they're doing. So like if you have someone, let's say you've got a game and it hits a loading screen, you're gonna see their pupils hit three millimeters because that's just, Born. There's nothing to do. They're purely waiting. Uh, as soon as the game loads in, you're going to see their pupils hit four millimeters. Oh, I'm in a game. This is exciting. Um, and then as they start playing, let's say they encounter their first enemy. As soon as they see that enemy, their pupil size is going to spike to five millimeters. Ooh, um, I'm in a fight. This is super exciting. Um, as soon as they kill that opponent or unfortunately meet their end, um, the moment either the opponent drops or they do, the pupil size will drop back to one of those two levels. If they're still in the game, it's going to, let's say, go back to four, which is your, your game baseline. And if they've been eliminated and they're at a game over menu, that's about as boring as a loading screen. So that's going to be a, a three. Or you might even see a little dip. There's an aversion. It's unpleasant to, to see the game over screen. Uh, but for the most part, you know, that would be boring. So there is this interesting threshold of engagement and cognitive load where if, if you push it too high, it just kind of sucks. Ah, yes. And um, this is awesome. Yeah, Ryan's going to have a bunch of good stuff for us to cover. Yes, Ryan, this is great. So just a few more minutes, uh, seven, if that works. This is great. But let's go over the, the sensors and let's go over the metrics. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so the cognitive load is really, 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 really stimulus dependent. Um, I can, let's see, I don't think I'm sharing. Do I have one of these videos? Yeah, okay. Cool. So maybe just for fun, I will show. Um, a few minutes of footage of a player playing Apex Legends. And um, let's see, should I do the entire screen? Okay, cool. So if you wondered what cognitive load looks like, here is an example. So this is our stuff. Uh, pupil size is in the top right. The length of the fixation in milliseconds is in the bottom right. The shape of their power spectrum including the frequency fit of their EEGs in the bottom right. And their particular EEG activity at that time is in the, is in the bottom. So you're kind of seeing this multimodal mix of uh, pupil and uh, fixation. So 
What does this look like in action? I've always wondered how, how smooth this frame rate is on Crowdcast. Oh, this is actually fine. So yeah, this is what it looks like when, uh, when someone's actually at start the task. Cool. All right. Hey. So actually, let's go back to the drop and do the whole shebang. Cool. So yeah, this is pretty much what an example of, of you know, cognitive load looks like. You've got uh, the person's about to drop from the drop ship. Um, so this is kind of exciting. It's the start of the match. The pupil size is around five millimeters. You'll notice there's a little bit of asymmetry between the eyes. And that's pretty normal in our recordings. So you've got that. You're also seeing some EG activity. Um, the delta, the theta is spiking. So this person is actively making decisions about where they're gonna go. That's why you see that delta activity. And then finally, the, the frequency slope has flattened out. And this is one of the indicators that we have that something of high you know, intensity is happening because when the brain momentarily flattens like this, it's usually like a reconfiguration and then it, and then it will also sort of sharpen back up. So a lot of things are going on that are telling us, hey, this person's pretty excited to start the round. And um, yeah, so you'll notice they're looking around with the green circle indicates where their eyes are looking. And so they are, they are assessing certain parts of the screen. Now, you'll notice that the pupil size has dropped a little bit. So we're down at four and a half. And let's look at some of the initial things that happen. I just, uh, we'll just do this for a minute or two. I figure, you know, this way you can, you can have some tangible sense of what these things look like. So, uh, okay, we've got, this person's about to go through a door. Now, you'll notice that the pupil size has gone up quite a bit, and that's because they're on the ground, and that means that they're at risk. In Apex Legends, at the start of the match, it is typically a very dangerous thing. It has the maximum amount of players in the fixed maps. you got 60 people running around. So you have the highest chance of encountering another player at the very start of the game. Also, you are unprepared at the very start of the game. So the start of this game is very, the start of Apex and similar uh, battle arena type games are all generally quite stressful on purpose. I think it's, it's meant to be exciting. Okay, so you can see that as this person enters this building, um, they, their pupil size starts to drop. I'm not, um, this was collected, this is another different person. But I can guess that once you enter a building this early into the thing, if you don't see anyone, you know that you're not at risk. So the pupil size is dropping because this player is no longer waiting if someone's going to attack them around the corner. They're focusing on the task of looting the items. That task is fairly safe. Their pupil size drops. Uh, okay, so now it goes up as they process the items one by one, right? So there's a little bit of thinking involved. Oh, hey, this is what I picked up. What are the implications? You can see it as these spikes. And then uh, we settle into a more regular type of gameplay. Okay, again, we're looting items. Again, we're seeing these little spikes. Person had a blink in there. And this is pretty much it. So I just wanted to show a little bit. It's very context driven. It's very responsive. If you're sitting in a room looting, it'll be 4.6. But if this person was to get in a firefight, I am quite sure that you would see, let's see if we can find, ah, here we go. So if there was a firefight. There's probably something right before that. Cool. So uh, yeah, here it is a firefight and you'll note 5.2, 5.3 was our old maximum. Yeah, we were way past that. So um, interesting things, uh, dear game developers that are watching this, the most exciting part of your game is shooting the other player with a gun <laughs> and everything else. Everything else is just sort of uh, messing around. But you know, I'm being glib. If you if you had nothing but a shooter, you know, it's deathmatch. It actually becomes boring, right? That goes right back to this intensity. So when you pace an experience right, when you have these excursions, you can get to these sort of building intensities uh, that are pleasurable. So I hope that that helps demystify a little bit the uh, the pupil size side of things. Okay. And uh, Itamar had an ex another excellent question. Can we, fear of height training. Yes. Um, walking the plank simulator is uh, a great example of that. Okay, cool. So I think, um, like I mentioned earlier, the fear aversion, et cetera. Awesome. Cool. 
So um, let's take a minute and um, all right. Thank you very much for sitting through my presentation. Now, we're going to open up the, I, I would love to have some speakers come up. If you would like to introduce yourself, please let me know. You can either message me or raise your hand or whatever. Just say, hey, I'd like to speak. It's cool anytime. Um, and Ryan has a bunch of stuff he wants to share with us. I'm super excited to hear about it. This is cool. Ryan is from Noisebridge here in San Francisco, and he's going to tell you all about Noisebridge. Let me tell you, there are very few people that know as much about VR as Ryan does. And so it's a real pleasure to have him here, and it's, it's just awesome to... Uh, to have him share his knowledge with us. So uh, I'm inviting Ryan up to the stage. It's gonna be great. And yeah, if anybody else would like to say hello, chime in, introduce yourself, cool. Also the chat's available. And thank you all for the wonderful questions and uh, comments so far. And then once Ryan gets a chance to chat, we'll take a look at the spicy data a little bit later. Don't worry if this call is late for anyone. Um, every one of these videos gets uploaded to YouTube the whole length. And the archive, the webinar is going to be available for later viewing as well. So um, if you need to dip out at any time um, because you're, you're busy or it's getting late or anything like that, feel free. We don't, it doesn't bother us. And, um, you know, happy to, uh, to have you whenever. Ryan. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah, this has been a very interesting <laughs> discussion so far. And one of the things is teaching game flow design and pretty much everything you've been talking about, difficulty levels, cognitive, that's something I teach a lot um, wow. at college. Like, there's specific graphs I can actually, if I can share my screen... I oh yeah yeah you've got you should be like a presenter with uh... oh yeah I see uh share screen I'm Jake going to share this entire screen let's see um okay so I first want to show a few simple images are you okay. able to see this yes this is wonderful so this is like the simplest um game flow flow diagram this is something almost every game designer knows by heart um and this there's a few different versions of this chart that include um whether you include time like three-dimensional versions of this because this one it just how hard are the challenges? How high are the skills? And generally, this this is following time. This channel follows time. So as your skills improve, the challenges need to improve as well. But you can very easily go in and out of this um, methodology. But then if you look at most games have levels, this is actually more accurate to how you would design a level-based game. Is you'd want each level to often start slightly lower than the last level ended, but often require skills you learned in the previous level or world so um but then there's also yeah, i right. wish i had a bigger I'm sorry first. to interrupt you ryan oh Can yeah go back to that previous i would just like to make an observation this is a great great slide so one of the things that game developers really struggle with is finding the sweet spot of you know game being unapproachable for new players or uninteresting for veteran players and one of the things that this chart really kind of shows in a clear way is the, the sequence of the events is different. You lose the low skill players up front. Um, the anxiety bar for them comes in first uh, because if a game is overwhelming, when people sit down at it, they go, nope, <laughs> and they do something else. Yeah. That's just I, it. And then I might be talking, I have a beautiful uh, document and, and then, yeah, talking and, and about that. The only thing, and then the boredom 
is your your skilled player issue that's your attrition over time because it's no longer interesting to them there's there's not any challenge it's not worth the time so yeah i just wanted to you know this is something game developers struggle with and it's cool that you can kind of see that even in this sorry go right ahead ryan yeah um just because i have ones that talk about the anxiety and boredom so like in this one um we this bottom little graph kind of shows how like the flow zones for novice versus hardcore players actually takes different trajectories this is pretty well known and that's often when you have a easy medium and hard mode in a game um but sometimes it is very hard to make games where you can choose difficulty levels in the game um let me find the um ah dynamic difficulty adjustment in computer games so this is something that is constantly being looked at because in video games accessibility is a big deal especially these days so um we often try to make games that have systems that allow the most people to play without having difficulty so color blindness is hearing impairment subtitles cognitive impairment this is actually a kind of this helps a lot with flow is if a game is too hard there's very cool tricks to make things more identifiable so um this is an example where they change um the they make it easier for you to notice where you need to grab that is a very simple way of making a video game easier for a person to traverse um right. dyslexia motion sickness motor impairment um but adaptive difficulty this is one of the things that biosensors are going to make much much easier mm -hmm. and this has been something game developers have been waiting decades for um just to show um uh yeah this this talk back in um to th gdc 2012 mm -hmm. um this is a really good talk about how you design game flow so um it and uh I definitely, I'll paste a link to this. I definitely recommend people watch it if they want to understand game flow. And oh, yeah. about, this came out in 2012, but they were um, in the playtesting and stuff. They were already talking about biosensors and VR and stuff. So eye tracking. This that is a old eye tracking pair of glasses from the late like probably around 2010 they already were tr using these to understand the game flow and how hard games are for people to play um yeah um yeah there's a lot of historical knowledge about game, about flow and um another pretty fun short talk is let me find it um the shapes of stories so this is like the simplest thing out there but um when you 
look at how different shories have shapes in terms of stress, they most of them have a known shape. Like these are some well-known stories that you have you can understand the shape of the like action and stress um pretty well. Um but yeah, so devices like the HP Reverb, which is now shipping, or the Omnicept, so you can get it by the end of this month, is that it allows you to um, do a lot of the different things re like um, Alex was mentioning um, with relation to checking if someone is in this flow channel because it can be there's a long history of play testing and using very rudimentary techniques to figure out if someone is in an anxiety threshold or boredom threshold and but usually that requires hours of play testing with lots of different people. Whereas with eye tracking, every single person becomes, in essence, their own play tester for every game they play. And they are able to um, adjust games using these metrics so that you're always in the correct flow, um, which this would save a massive amount. So it, in like the business and like game design aspect, having these different sensors, if you can figure out the stress level of a person, even mm -hmm. slightly rudimentary, you'll probably save a bunch of money on play testing Right. Because you won't have to do as much. You'll be able to dynamically adjust the games, which means you'll have a larger player base. Mm -hmm. So pretty much having these biosensors will, like, for big companies, it just makes them more money because it saves them money on playtesting. And it makes them more money because they have a bigger player base because they aren't, it's able to be played by um, anyone. Um, and there is a very different feeling for adaptive difficulty versus the designs that people do with um, difficulty levels because one person might be very good at um, puzzle games or something but bad at shooter games and if they're mm -hmm. playing a game like um, that has both of those elements mm -hmm. they to stay in that flow they have to turn down the difficulty of the shooter elements but turn up the difficulty of the puzzle elements to keep right. that person engaged. So to do that, you need to dynamically doing it. Changing easy, yeah. medium, hard, absurd difficulty won't adjust those things independently. It will put them at a level. That's why, like, for me, I sometimes actually have to change difficulty during the gameplay because mm -hmm. there's at the beginning i kind of like a slow gradual curve but then i pick it up very quickly after a certain point and i want it to be harder right. and dynamic difficulty allows it to adjust for every player right. which it it's something that is probably it would be nice if this could be done for things other than just vr games mm -hmm. which 
might be doable if eye trackers and stuff like Toby's become a bit more accessible right. and you're able to get other bio data like the heart rate sensor right. or um let's see like facial cameras would be good but i don't think a lot of people want to have the web their webcam on right. looking at them while they're playing a video game that a I bit had a weird. A question about VR eye trackers. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but I thought I'd ask the um, which other than the index and the HP, are there any other devices on the market or about to hit market that have this eye tracking built into them? Eye tracking has been in VR devices since the beginning, pretty much. Actually, they like the yes, the, but the or data the, wasn't available. The Vive Pro Eye, which has Toby Eye trackers, that's been available since 2017. Right. Um, a... But it was hard to get. They, it was only, it was like 2019 that they started selling those to consumers. And they, it took a while before they brought the price under like two grand. Um, but there have been, there's been a company called Seven Invention um, mm -hmm. that's been making add-on eye trackers right. for a couple of years, but they those were really hard to get outside of China. Right. Um, so I like if you look at the really old VR headsets, like the ones from the huh? 80s and 90s, those all had eye trackers huh? almost. That oh, ones... worked. Terrible. Of the ones you can buy today. <laughs> yeah, um, this... I think it's the Index and the HP. Is there any other ones? Or the Index doesn't have eye trackers. It doesn't? No, no the base not. Index does not have eye tracking. Okay. Um, the It's only the Vive Pro I and now oh. the HP Reverb G2. Okay. But they, someone is, people are working on eye tracker add-ons for, um, the index, but, um. Okay, so that is pretty bonkers. The Pro I used to be $1,500. The HP is 500 600 No, no. The HP Reverb G2 is 1249 Ooh, well, the current spicy. the current price at the Vive Pro I is thirteen ninety nine, so about a hundred fifty dollars more. Which but why? Uh, why does this web page say five fifty? No, but that of... was the original price of the original HP Reverb. The uh, this is. Like, no, that's that is not the Omnicept. Ah, that's it's the Omnicept. I I put is. the link in. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Hey, okay. This is this is a little more like it. So yeah. fifteen fifteen hundred. Uh, have two no, to no, tw itch. twelve fifty so it's about hundred fifty dollars cheaper than the Vive Pro I. But the problem is is other than the Vive Pro I being an older headset, the Vive Pro I still has much better tracking right. um overall. Um and you can uh and it has better controllers if you upgrade the controllers but yeah, the hp reverb has a better um uh screens on it higher resolution right. and it has the ppg and the face camera which you can get a face camera for the mm -hmm. um htc headsets that's not really very great but they don't have the pre like 
designed cognitive load metrics that Omnicept has. Omnicept pretty much comes out of the box ready to integrate without you having to do all that much, which that is, really is a big deal. And because yeah. they didn't put it behind a um, business wall mm -hmm. and make it only available to business or professionals, right. they or this is already a very logical thing for people to get if they want to start using this sort of data in their game design and their app design. Like the best um, eye tracking experience I've had in VR was, uh, let me find the, well, yeah. If um, would you agree with the statement that if somebody wants to use a VR device to do um, research, like initial exploration or whatever, this um, this reverb and the Pro I are basically their two best choices. And it seems like this reverb kind of gets you a fairly modern suite of sensors, and um, you know you can. You can start experimenting pretty soon. So, I mean, it's pretty wild to consider that, like, a lab that can buy one of these um, HPs, I think, can start collecting data. It's kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be extremely easy to collect the data from some of these devices. Like, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure Toby still probably isn't giving you access to everything unless you pay for it, like usual. But well, it's, cognitive load was the thing that they used to hold back. So if that's yeah, in the, there's nothing else. Pupil size is the thing is the cool part of the eye tracker, other than yeah. these locations. So yeah, I I also like I'd really like high. Also, one thing that's really nice about using these in a VR headset is mm -hmm. because it's running at ninety hertz. Right. The and like everything's running faster right so the data can be like analyzed more data more better mm -hmm. yeah 11, much. 11 millisecond frames instead of 16 it makes a difference yep and um soon a lot of these things will get even faster i think the next generation of a lot of these headsets is going to just be 120 frames per second. But well, there's uh, a... Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Because that's what all the um, display manufacturers are now making, is mm -hmm. almost everyone has moved to try to make 120 hertz um, for phones and stuff. And the lenses in, or the screens in VR headsets are pretty much just slightly modified phone right. screens that are a different um, pixel number, but it's like the backplane and the manufacturing is almost identical. Right. And I think for people trying to get these metrics from the devices, like the HP is your, the Vive Pro I is your today's solution. The HP is your tomorrow, like in October when they ship. Uh, yeah. The Galia is your next summer solution yeah. where you add EEG, you add all uh, the yeah, sensors. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have actual pressure or um, muscle and... Mm -hmm. um, EDA, you have skin e conductance. Yeah. yeah, it's like having an emotive bit on your face, which yeah. is interesting. Which, that's going to definitely be a big deal, but that's also because... yeah. It's going to be a that's going to be more open than a lot of these, right. but also they aren't probably going to be unless um Valve, who OpenBCI has partnered with, creates a um API thing in their Steam VR right. API that you use when programming that has pre-developed algorithms for cognitive load and stuff or right. gaze that's the really it will be harder to use or it will be hard to use um 
because right now, now that we have these devices, we need game devs to use those features. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of features in current VR headsets that people don't use. VR headsets have a microphone. Why do you never talk to characters in a VR game yeah, with yeah, your real voice? I've impressive. tried three games that have allowed that and pretty much none other. It's strange because audio really has a lot of characteristics. You can kind of tell emotion a little bit. Um, you can also see sort of from the speech pattern. It's quite interesting and you're right. So as far as I can tell though, I think writing your own software and having it be hidden behind an API is always the barrier for this stuff. Because if you're asking a game developer who's pressed for time, they've got six months to put something together, you know, not to mention like their company gets bought three times <laughs> during that six months, right? It's a, it's a grind, but, and then on top of that, now what? You're gonna get familiar with these cognitive measures. You're gonna figure out how to use them. You're gonna figure out how to like implement them in your game. It's a little bit of expertise, but what I was so excited by with the HP video that we saw is that this hardware manufacturer just put it front and center. You don't have to do it yourself. It's just there for you. And yeah, that's gonna be a little less flexible than the Galia, but unless it, Ryan really captured the issue, unless Valve delivers sort of a middleware layer where you don't have to understand it, it just abstracts it for you, um, and someones they're going to have to implement it themselves. And yeah, that's, but that's it's likely Valve will do that because, like, when I'm using Unity and I'm doing Steam VR games, mm -hmm. I can I literally install the Steam VR. API package, right, and right, that course. gives me all the tools to interface with all of this Steam VR ape-like stuff, because Steam VR has a lot of feature sets on the Steam side that interface with any game that runs on Steam right. VR, right. and this, it's a middle layer. Um, it's a really efficient middle layer as well, like compared to um oculus middle late where when you run a oculus headset on your computer that adds like five percent load to your computer that middleware mm -hmm. the steam vr on a lot of in a lot of situations only adds maybe 1% or 2%. It's like, it's a noticeably easier right, right. thing to run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with all of these experiments, complexity is the enemy. If if you've got a lab that's already got a VR setup, but on top of that, you need a grad student that understands how to do the multimodal, and you got a different one that can pipe it into MATLAB, <laughs> what that really means is you've got only a handful of labs that can do all of this. And so yeah. to me, you know, maybe we're, talking about it a lot. I have to admit, Ryan and I are passionate about our VR here at Neurotech San Francisco, but this is so cool. It's like a, it's a major moment. It means that everybody that buys that HP, the developers, if they choose to, can sort of try to get their state information. So it's yeah. just fascinating that, and I, I wonder how much Valve announcing the Galia motivated HP like oh wait if this is the route then let's do it you know type of thing. I so. I mean I know H all of the big VR companies have had this hardware in, on their back burner for uh, a while and right. they were kind of waiting till the right time because they so they all messed up when they released like the VR headsets and kind of the price points and stuff like so many of them the did not do great from like 2016 to 2018. And a lot of them would have been a lot better off had they tabled certain releases of newer headsets. But now we're at the point where people are buying these things in the way they buy a new computer or a phone. Like it's still a big investment, but they do have a, use for it and the, there's enough experiences that people want to try like yeah. there are not that many great vr experiences like 
if you look online at a majority of what people play in VR, there's only about 50 games mm -hmm. that are considered what I'd say to be AAA games. Whereas if you go over to regular PC, right. Xbox, or PlayStation, you can get 50 games at that level per month, no problem. Um, yep, I agree. The launch yeah. was premature, badly done. It wasn't exciting. The pricing was all wrong. There was a drought of software for years. But luckily, I do think the situation has gotten better. And, and I just, I'm super, super stoked that HP has decided to implement the the tools because i i'm just i'm excited to see that data speaking of data how about we take a look at the the spicy data with a, a few comparison reports yeah oh wait there's one question how long does we we see vr induced mood bars placing like oxygen or all the other mm -hmm. yeah like exactly bars. oh like Imagine real world bars i thought they were talking about health bars <laughs> um no no i think but... i think mood bar oh that too yeah but right no no, no that's uh, that's an interesting yes. question so please that's something i've been uh, so i've tried a few vr arcades and talked with people who've owned vr arcades and different things and the i know people who run one of the only vr gyms in the u.s um black box vr where they built a custom machine that interfaces with a vr headset and you it's a a, a resistance training machine that you use while in vr and it's really cool i haven't gotten to try it yet but i've tried like vr exercise bikes like vr is going to replace or improve parts of gyms I'd say in the next decade for sure. Um, I think VR arcades are, that's a problem with the US style of business really is in Asia, VR arcades are amazing. They do fantastic. And something like a VR mood bar or like place where you can go chill and hang out. Um, and wear VR for relaxation, meditation. Um, that is something that I wouldn't be surprised if it already exists in somewhere in Asia. But in the US, it might be a bit harder just because of the hardware costs up front at times and the running costs. Like a VR arcade, the only way in the U.S. to have a VR arcade that works well is to have no staff. Right. Like, that's literally the only way it can be profitable. Um, or if you're allowed to have it open 24-7 and you're in a place that has a lot of people who would pay for that experience. But I think a VR mood bar would be something that you you could probably go after like people in the bay area for sure who they just like overhype every weird like trend what i do mean, you mean some I, I some mean, work I'm, but okay. like i mean i've i've met a ton of people who run um cryo um gym or like cryotherapy bars pretty much for people who and they're like we get a lot of gamers like they like la and the bay area which both have like five or six cryotherapy um places um they they all get a lot of gamers a lot of influencers a lot of tech people and it's now we're, I think we're starting to see saunas come back into fashion in that realm as well, right. um, which I'm happy about. But um, I, I also bring my heart rate tracker in a sauna, so I track my heart rate while I'm in the sauna. I really want to see, find out if I can make a waterproof case for the Moda bit because 
I want to see my like skin temperature response and like certain other things while in a sauna. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. track, like how to or EG or anything. Just like right. how do these different things affect cognitive ability or mm -hmm. affect like your state of mind or your body since that a lot of different mood places and whatnot it's about not just affecting your mind but putting your body in a certain state mm -hmm. that's one reason why saunas are very healthy is mm -hmm. it puts your body in a aerobic or anaerobic state pretty quickly mm -hmm. and it gets your blood flowing changes how you're processing different things so mm -hmm. that so, can be very helpful yeah and just to you know add what's neat about vr is it can very much affect your mood in a positive way um you can put yourself in a setting that's calming or pleasurable or relaxing and whatever else you've got going on it's it's quite immersive so you know even short breaks five, 10, 15 minutes, uh, the ability to transport you to another place. There's also an excellent question, um, which, which I definitely wanna get to in chat one moment. But yeah, I think, I think they will use VR to make mood adjustments um, in, in a variety of ways. So I'm not quite sure what the form factor is. Is it gonna be in a clinic? Is it gonna be something you have with you like a phone? You know, there's gonna be some way that you can um, induce mood changes. Okay, and um, the Facebook topic is a really, really good one from Supriya. Facebook has recently given up on their eye tracking and uh, EEG type treatments. And they had gone down that road like everyone else because of the, the VR aspect. They, they own Oculus and now it's the Quest but uh, they really didn't have a lot of success with it. They had uh, Facebook Labs had a lot of people working on it. And from what I can tell, their acquisition of control labs with the wrist um, haptics, so basic or sensing. So the idea is if you put this device on your wrist, it can figure out the configuration of your hand without holding a controller. So you can basically... Um, have this like if you want to point your finger at something without holding a controller you just point your finger and it can tell from your muscle movements oh that's what you're doing you're pointing your finger i'm going to make your avatar do that as well so from what i can tell facebook basically with that paper um announcing i think like 45 minute wpm 45 word per minute typing or something like that um in the chang lab in san francisco i let me let me find the Chang Lab SF Facebook. Yes. Uh, here is the announcement from Facebook. So this was one of those um, we declare success and also we declare that we're not doing this anymore. Um, so, yeah, they had a very limited, well, Mr. Zuckerberg's ambition was that they type 100 words per minute with their mind. This was back in 2017. Um, by 2021, it was scaled down to kind of like, you know, can we recognize one of 100 words from uh, the motor cortex to the, to the vocal tract? And it was for one specific subject, and it was a specific list of 100 words. Um, where was the words per minute? 16... I, I think they got the 17 words per minute, or no, wait, it was higher than that, but it was like, it was a okay number, but it had a really good accuracy, but it right. was also only out of 100 words. Which was yeah, and there was some pretty bad latencies. Like it was ten to yeah, 20 they, seconds from from thinking the thing to like the words coming. So um, that was the best they could do. After, I, I don't mean this to sound super. Um, if you look at it, 
I'm not uh, criticizing their efforts. If you look at it from a resource expenditure, if you put four years and a hundred researchers on something, and this is what you've got to show for it after four years, I think it it's just sort of natural to want to want to get something that's got a little more impact. So because the Quest 2 started taking off and because the purchase of Control Labs is incredibly promising, you know, they bought them for like half a billion, but it seems like it's very, very good tech. Then I think um, Facebook is trying to deal with their tracking controller problems for something like the Quest 3 or the Quest Pro. So yeah, that was a, I just wanted to link that article because that just came out um, in July and it was definitely a big strategy shift for Facebook. Um, I do, I do see a lot of benefit in these kinds of treatments and yeah, also there's, I mean, eye tracking research is being done, but Facebook really decided that they didn't want to go down this BCI route anymore and that they wanted to go to, to gesture. So I could still see that happening, but it would probably be through a third party that uses the HP platform, or it would be like some company that's using the Galia to, uh, to have like better instrumentation. That's great. Cool. Yeah. I Shall think we, we should some... go to spicy. Hey, let's do that. So, um, for those of you who may not be familiar, starting a few months ago, we started a spicy challenge using EEG. So, um, we're really big on these hack nights to like actually do projects and share data. Um, the discussion, you know, we love that stuff. And um, on top of that, we'd really like to feature any projects people are doing, any self collection you might be doing, if you're working something on a lab or even, you know, as part of your university studies, please tell us about it. Uh, I would love to hear about your experiences, what hardware are you using, what tools are you using to analyze, do you have any questions? Are you hitting any snags? Um, is this tool easy to use, difficult to use? Yeah, anything like that um, would be wonderful. So we put together a, uh, a GitHub, we put together a protocol, and here was what we were trying to do. Um, using consumer hardware, $300 or $1,000 EEGs, if we consume uh, some spicy liquid, can we see a response in the EEG? It started out as a very simple experiment. So we came up with a protocol, which is basically go ahead and do a five minute baseline. In an EEG, baseline means you sit there, you don't do anything. You don't read anything, you don't watch anything. Uh, you can do the baseline eyes open or closed. And however it is that you plan to consume the spicy food, go ahead and do the baseline that way. Once you've got the baseline recorded, start a recording and halfway through the five minute recording, go ahead and consume the spicy liquid. And for the case of this study, we said, go ahead and leave the spicy liquid or food in your mouth for the remainder of the time. You don't have to chew, you don't have to drink it, but really just, just get, the, get the burning sensation. And so really, I think this was kind of a mix of things. It was fun. We wanted to try a few devices, some of the common consumer things out there. We wanted to get people used to like doing a little bit of an experiment, submitting their data. And yeah, we wanted to kind of, okay, what do you actually see in an EEG if someone eats a bunch of spicy stuff in the middle? So for the data that we're looking at today, it's me uh, and it's my brain data. So it's, it's me responding to cayenne oil. Um, so if you're wondering what spicy thing, uh, I went on Amazon, I purchased capsaicin extract in the form of cayenne. And um, in the instructions, it tells you dilute one dropper of this in, in four ounces of water. And that's how I consumed it. So I took it per the instructions um, and we got a bunch of data. Cool. So why don't we take a look at some of the data and also see what you folks think of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Cool, we got this. So uh, first off, let me just show you some of the, the basics of the side-by-side -side reports. 
And basically, this is a way to com compare like two EEG recordings real quick. So the way all of these recordings work is there's a baseline in an experiment. The baseline on these comparisons is going to be on the left. The experiment is on the right. So these are the these reports we're going to kind of skim through. Um, they just kind of give us a little flavor for what's going on. But most of the good stuff is going to be from this report format where we can actually compare the values inside um, and we can look at multiple runs. But when you're looking at EEG, I really recommend that you start by looking at your data a couple of ways. And it's, it's just informative. Um, if you look at it any one way, there's going to be things that that chart or plot shows you. And then there's going to be things that it hides simply because something about the representation isn't going to show them to you. So if you have a couple of representations, you have a better chance of catching it. So the first thing you see is sort of the power spectrum. Um, you can see that there is a difference between the left and the right. However, there's also a fair amount of simple variation that happens with EEG. Electrodes shift, uh, brain activity changes slowly over time. Um, all kinds of things can happen. Maybe the phone rings while you're doing a recording or something buzzes. So there's a fair amount of variation in EEG. But here is the, the baseline condition where nothing is being administered and the spicy condition where spicy is being administered. Now, you can also see a bad electrode fit. And this is something I was mentioning earlier. On the left, in the baseline, channel 2 is fine. On the right, in the experiment, channel 2 is not fine. So this is where people typically mark EEG channels as bad. You'll notice that that's a standard piece of functionality with like ME Python with most of the EEG toolkits. And this is why EEG channels regularly go bad. And when they're bad, they are useless. Um, you really can't recover this. You really can't trust this. It's not accurate. And so you discard it. Um, here is channel three. We also have fit issues because it wasn't that big of a change, but channel four has got a good fit. We see the same kind of change. This little peak seems to go away and the overall power tends to go up. Uh, here is channel five, pretty similar, but again, we have this peak sort of dropping here. It kind of formed a double peak channel six. Again, the peak drops power kind of rises with broadband. Channel seven, eh, a little unreliable in this experimental condition. It, that's not, it's not what it should look like. It looks like dicey data. And channel eight is a little questionable on the baseline, but it's fine. You know, as long as you ignore this spike and this harmonic, you can still see the structure of the peak. It's just that like this stuff isn't quite right. And once again, you see this peak has changed. So yeah, what does this look like? Okay, here's the electrodes. You know, why was I saying channel two is bad? Well, that's not what EEG is supposed to look like. And if you look at this one, you know, yeah, channel two is a little off in the baseline, but it still follows the shape of the other stuff. You might be wondering, hey, what are these dips? Those are electrical notches. There's a big spike at 60 hertz. There's another spike at 120 hertz. And for some reason, in my environment, the crown also picks up some spike harmonics. It's 76 hertz, so okay, yeah, we take those out too. So yeah, and again, you when you compare EEG like this, oh, excellent, we have a question. Sampling frequency, 250 hertz for this device. And incidentally, I would say most consumer hardware seems to be in the 200 to 300 hertz range. Um, the big exception is the Emotive Epoch. That hardware was designed a few years ago and it was meant to compete with the research grade solutions. And so they go up to, I think, 2000 Hertz. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, really anything over 256 or 300 is, is probably not super useful. And that's why device manufacturers have standardized on it, even if it's some fairly high precision. So it's, um, I'll try not to bore you too much with NyQuest and sampling and why and this and that, but practically there's really very little upside to going above 300 Hertz. And so most device manufacturers don't. And this particular one is a 256. That's a great question. Um, let me just, I'll complete the thought so you're not wondering in mystery. It's because you see this frequency drop off. 
um, past 120 hertz, you're not going to get anything useful from an electrode that's that's going through the skull. There's this idea like, well, okay, if with Nyquist, you know, if I'm getting a bunch of samples, maybe I have more precision or maybe I have something that I don't have. But actually you don't. With EEG, if you want more precision, the trade-off is time. So, so there's no one second of data is one second of data, no matter the sample rate, right? It's, it's how many seconds of data, but precision is sample rate agnostic. And I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a complicated topic, but I definitely wanted to kind of touch on it so that if you, if you run across this, maybe um, you have the idea. So basically, um, the higher your sample rate, the higher you go in frequency and only frequency. But with electrodes that are outside the skull, you're not going to get anything above 128 because of physical limitations. So if your EEG was transcranial, if it was inside the skull, yeah, sure, go up to, you know, 1,000 hertz or 2,000 hertz or something because you'll be able to sample it. But all these devices are on top of the skull, which means you don't get anything by going above 300. I'm sure I made a mess of that. I just wanted to try to answer that a little bit. Okay, and then here we can see the power spectrum plots in particular. So this is that cool uh, University of San Diego package called FOOF. And the neat thing is you can see some of the changes that happen. So like in the first situation, we had this 8.39 hertz frequency peak with a power of 0.93 above the ambient level. Now, there's a whole bunch of technical things, but just think of this as a quantification that you can compare. Yeah, that's really all it is. Um, so the bandwidth is how wide the peak is, the power is how tall the peak is, and the CF is the central frequency of that peak. So let's compare that, the big alpha peak here in this other one, it's shifted to 8.62, and it's half the power that it was in the previous. That's a big difference. And so it is neat that, you know, with these various ways of looking at it, you can see different aspects of this data. Like, it's very hard to m compare that quantification to know that one peak is almost half the size of the other. But if you use tools like FOOF, which was, like I said, I can't think... Uh, Dr. Wojtek's lab at UCSD enough for, for publishing this on GitHub and doing the research. But yeah, these tools really allow you to, to create parameters for these neural oscillations and it lets you compare the different recordings. Okay, so we're just gonna flip through, you know, each electrode is gonna have a slightly different view, um, but the quantifications let you compare the oscillations. Like here you say, oh, it went from 8.45 to 8.68. You can definitely see that the model is fitting pretty well. So it's giving you R squared and it's giving you error values that are sort of statistical. If you're familiar with R squared fits and errors, these are, these are valid. So, and then you can also see like frequency shifts and it's kind of neat. Like you'll notice that on channel one, we really didn't shift much in theta but we did shift a little bit in delta, like here, delta is closer to one hertz, but it does shift upwards towards two hertz. You'll notice that the shape, these are, these are called violin plots. They're hard to interpret numerically, but they let you kind of look at the distribution of the data in a quick way. And yeah, so you'll see that the frequencies really don't shift. It's kind of a power change, right? That's what these plots let you kind of observe is like, oh, here the, you know, this change, but then again, channel two is not reliable. So it's cool. These plots give you a very quick visual reference. But here is the more interesting part, which is comparing the baseline to the experimental condition with band power. And there's a much better way to do this, um, which is these, these other plots that I'll show you. But this just kind of lets you look at it over time. You'll see that it, they're actually kind of similar. But... Um, in the baseline, I've got this kind of drift over time, and that's probably me daydreaming. And in this, there's a very sudden onset. Also, you'll notice that the theta shifts upwards and follows this. And it's hard to see just because the scale is so different, but the beta and the gamma shift too. 
Now, this is going to be one of the first things that I'll point out with EEG tends to be a challenge with interpretation and why EEG is typically normalized in a lot of scenarios is, you know, this is the difference in power because lower frequencies travel through the skull better. But the reality is inside the brain, it's not that different. You know, yes, the lower powers have the, the higher power. Um, the lower frequencies have higher power, but this is greatly, this, this is distorted by the skull and the ease of the electrical signals to travel through it. So channel two, untrustworthy in our experiment. We're just gonna ignore that plot channel three yeah. but channel four lets us see some of these differences hey this is clear spike there's these changes so again not no one of these plots kind of gives it the full picture but we can start to see some of these shifts and then finally okay what's the ratio of the bands well we had a lot more delta at the start we've got way more beta right we had nine percent of our power was beta now we're at 12 percent. it's a big shift uh, gamma almost doubles from 2% to 3.5%. It's a big shift. So these things can be hard to read, but by using these various forms of interpretation, you can see them. Okay, so that is the side-by-side -side comparison. Hope that gives you a good view of what that data looks like. Let's take a look at these comparisons because I really wanted to show this part. Uh, any questions, I'll just pause for a moment and then we'll dive into the comparisons and the subsamples. Beautiful. Okay, cool. Let's go for it. So what happens when you consume spicy food? Well, we're going to take a look at this a couple different views. We've got this line plot view. And I'm going to scroll past the initial stuff. And we're going to start looking at the power spectrums. And then um, there's another couple of ways we can do this. But what do we see? Well, in this baseline, there's one pattern for delta on channel 1. When we do the experimental condition, which is the orange, which is where we actually administer the spicy food, there is a clear shift because before it's kind of following and yeah, this one drifts, but this one stays below 100 microvolts cumulatively in the delta band. And once you apply the spicy food, you shoot up to 400. So that is a quadrupling of the power that is in that portion of the frequency band in your brain. And that is pretty significant. I will say that having been looking at EEG over the last few years, you don't typically see responses this strong or this consistent with behavioral interventions. I mean, sometimes you do, but it's, it's unusual. So this was pretty neat that we started getting some pretty good responses. Now, channel two, which we talked about, is a little dicey in this data set. So we're going to skip past it. And oh, I'm sorry, we're still on channel one. Uh, now we're looking at the theta. So uh, theta, we see a spike. In fact, it's a double spike, double peak. It has, uh, we're about 20 to 30. And then you multiply by four because you're spiking at 140. So it's well over four times as much. And then it kind of drops. And then there's a second wave. Kind of neat because the stimulus isn't changing. The spicy food is in the subject's mouth continuously so this processing this, this two cycles is something it's not it's not the spice being removed and coming back in it's it's something different which is kind of cool if we go look at the alpha we don't see a response it's kind of interesting right here the baseline had a little spike probably an anomaly but it's all pretty quiet it's pretty consistent now the beta different story we do get another quadrupling. We're going from about 20 microvolts in the beta band to a big response. And now we're going for gamma. Let me see it. Okay. So I shared these plots before. Let's start looking at some interesting stuff, right? I decided to start rolling up several of these studies. So uh, instead of doing one-to-one -one comparisons, what if we took a look at um, three trials in a row and we said, let's look at the baselines. Now, we're going to get some variations. These recordings are about eight hours apart. But I think it's good to see, okay, if we just look at the baselines by themselves, what do we see? Well, to me, they're pretty, pretty flat, right? Um, not a lot of change. Sure, there's a little variation. There's some noise. There's some 
processes that are happening. Um, but they're definitely really consistent. Okay, well, let's flip through the electrodes and see what we see. Right. So we're going to start with the delta on channel one, pretty consistent. On orange day, there's a really clear recording, or maybe the signal was a little low, one of the two. But there is a separation. The blue and the purple tend to follow each other. So I would say that those are almost identical. The orange is a little bit different. So that kind of jumps out. Of, oh, okay, those, those two track together better. Um, here is theta. Well, actually, these are all pretty similar. But again, there isn't a lot of changes. Uh, here is alpha. Okay. Wow, interesting. We actually have you know two of these show a, a spike, but uh, you know that's kind of unusual, right? Compared to the other channels, beta, very similar pattern, just amplitude differences. Again, these are three recordings eight hours apart. Uh, gamma, pretty similar. I mean. They're going to look different, but for, for the range, this is pretty close. Um, the fact that these axes change can make these charts a little hard to interpret sometimes, but definitely this is actually quite close. It's just that the chart is zoomed in, um, so they look more separated. Paradoxically, this data is really far apart, but it looks, looks like they're close together because the, the scale kind of blew out the chart. So... Um, these really are similar. So yeah, as we flip through the channels, uh, we're gonna skip past two and three. Uh, five tends to be pretty good on me. Let's use that one. Let's flip through theirs. Oh, of course. Here, uh, we've got a bad fit. Cool. So here is the delta pattern. Here is the theta pattern. Here is the alpha pattern. Again, we see these peaks, which is kind of interesting. Uh, beta pattern, very similar. Okay. What do we see on this spicy? We're going to do three trials of consuming spicy food. How consistent is it? Well, uh, let's get down to the band power channels. Pretty consistent. Look at that delta. You can really see all three events. And what jumps out is, whoa, look at that. The magnitude of the response is pretty dang different. Like one day, the spike is you know going from whatever to 200. One day, a spike is to 500. And then over here, wowza, we get up to 1,000. Now, interestingly enough, um, I do recall that I was trying to increase uh, the uh, dosage. Excellent question from the audience. Did I time it with the ingestion time point? I didn't at first. And I know that this is horrible, right? What what sloppy experimental design. Um, I didn't clarify, do you do the spicy food exactly at 2 minutes 30? And I didn't want to make the experiment too complicated. You know what I mean? Like, like um, intimidating. So instead, I made it sloppy. And you can actually see that sloppiness here. Because the response is pretty uniform. But in the purple recording... I definitely start earlier than in the orange and the blue recording. So, yeah, you can actually see the differences. And this is why neuroscientists um, or scientists in general focus so much on timing, alignment, and precision. Because if you don't have it, here is three responses. And the fact that they're not aligned takes away from the, the punch of this, right? If you're only going to publish once. And if you're only going to have one figure that you can put in your nature paper, um, you don't want it to look like this. So I totally understand. But at the same time, I do encourage people to do self-collection to a different standard than researchers that are aiming to publish in a major journal. In the sense of you don't need to make that bar that high for yourself. You can still gain useful insight um, from whatever method. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I think there are two different communities. And for the scientists, this is this is cringe, like mega cringe. And I think for hobbyist hackers with like three hundred dollar EGs, it's pretty cool that there's actually something in the data. So again, different perspectives depending on how you look at it. But excellent question. No, the precision is uh, moderate at best. Okay. The cool thing though is. It does seem like all of these responses have an onset and then a trail off because I'm not removing the spicy food from my mouth, but each of these does show a pretty clear arc. 
Okay, so let's get out of the delta band. The theta band shows some pretty good responses. Here, the alignment looks a little better, but that's only because orange starts a little earlier. But yeah, you can see, look at how well this lines up. Pretty cool. Uh, we look at alpha. No response on alpha in channel one. Pretty interesting. Purple's got a shade of a response, but it's so minor compared to the other channels, it's not even a doubling in power, um, that it's definitely different. Than the, than the other responses. But I would say on purple, you see a hint of it. On the other ones, you really don't, which is, which is anomalous. Most of the bands do show it, but alpha for my brain really doesn't seem to show. Beta, pretty nice plot. Look at that, three, bam, there we go. And they clearly all respond. And now you have, again, sort of these three amplitudes. You got orange, you got blue, and you got purple. Um, colloquially, I was trying to ramp up the amount here and again now you're going to say wait you weren't measuring the exact administration yes yes we're going to scale it up we're going to make it more precise we're going to have precise timing and I'm, I'm varying the dosage i'm currently in the process of collecting that data so there will be a second round and you're going to find out way more about my brain data but here's what we got for right now so yeah really shows a response really shows an interesting time frame i thought it was cool Gamma also shows a huge response. I mean, this is great. This is really great. So let's take a look at, um, this is, now, due to a bug, I can't process more than six files simultaneously. So this is a little bit, we fixed the bug, but I didn't have time to do it for today's hack night. So bear with me. Here's what it looks like if you stack the baselines and the experiments together. So now we're looking at six data files. Now. You might be thinking to yourself, wow, that looks messy. Yeah, it does. It does. It absolutely does. But some of the charts don't. Well, that's what's kind of cool about this, right? Um, sure. The ones that look messy, yeah, we're fine. We're not looking at those. But hey, that data chart looks pretty cool. And now you can kind of see how the baselines don't show that spike and the data chart for the experiments do show that spike. So you can... I know the legend is a little goofy, so we can kind of come in here and get the charts. The blue is our baseline. The orange is, you know, one of the spicy experiments. The purple is a baseline. The gray is a spicy experiment. Green. Uh, one. Oh, oh boy. Sorry. I'm not going to give uh, color codes, but yeah, baseline and then spicy on the light blue. So you can see that the baselines stick together. You can see that the three that show a deflection are the spicy. The gray is the spicy halfway through. The orange is the spicy halfway through. And the blue is the spicy halfway through. And in all cases, you can see that the baselines really track before the administration. I mean, these are, these are clustered in the bottom part of the chart. But as soon as you put the spicy in, you get some changes. Uh, we're going to alpha. Again, look at look at how we don't see a response in alpha. Like compared to the other charts, it really this this to me is basically, you know, one trend, and it doesn't really shift. There's a few excursions, but it doesn't really shift. Compare that to beta. And all these baselines don't shift, but all the baselines go to a new high that's completely new. And again, gray, orange, and light blue are the experiments. And gamma, same trend. So I really thought this was neat. Um, how you choose to interpret this is up to you. But yeah, you can measure someone's spicy response using a consumer EEG device and using some fairly basic tools and procedures. I mean, in this case, it's pretty clear that some fascinating things are happening with your brain signaling while your body is processing that capsaicin response. So yeah. I thought that was really, really neat. And um, I do have two more charts I can show where we can look at all the baselines and we can look at all the experimental conditions. Um, and that'll just be real quick. But yeah, any questions on these plots, the experiments, what we saw, uh, the data is on GitHub. But yeah, this is just, hey, if you were to conduct an EEG experiment, and if you were to analyze and interpret it, here's what you might get. Okay, let's take a look at the last two. We're just gonna look at the 
five trials. I threw out one of the baselines that I had a bad recording on. Um, it's not super rigorous, but at the same time, it's just visually easier to parse. I can show you the other chart that has an ugly line that's different from all the other ones, but yeah, this is the one with it omitted. So here are all the baselines, all five that we've collected over the past um, month and change since we've been doing this data collection. And yeah, again, you can see that pretty much, yeah, there are variations, but uh, let's see here. <laughs> yeah, how long until we, I mean, this is a great question. I I wonder, you know, um, here is the theta response here. There's this peak, you know, I wonder what people would be interested in, in looking at. Uh, but this is, I think this data is fairly compelling. I wasn't expecting it to come through that clear on a, on a consumer EG. So again, with the baselines, we see these peaks, right? But really very, very similar. You look at this beta, one data point that's off can show you how much these track, right? This would be close to one of those other plots where, where it does have the data. And you can just see, wow, these baselines. I mean, depending, if you zoom the chart, sure, it looks like there's variation, but the reality is, yeah, day to day, up and down, baseline looks like baseline. Uh, look at this gamma baseline. Again, we got kind of lucky we have one data point, but you can see like gamma just does not shift much. It's so, so range bound. Um, let's compare that i mean sorry uh we'll just finish i think that was it data gamma we can look at some of the other electrodes let's do channel five okay so here you can see one of the baselines is definitely different uh the purple on the delta side but the theta matches the alpha matches the beta matches gamma matches etc so pretty cool stuff Let's look at the good stuff. What happens when we do five trials of spicy? This is all five data, live data put together. Okay, so let's go. Band channel one, delta. Hey, look at that. I mean, you can see it. Now, what's wild is when you stack all five of these trials, orange looks so tiny that it almost looks like a non-response. You know, in the, in the other plot, it was like super big and zoomed in. And you're like, wow, that's... It's, you know, all three are deflecting, just that one, not so much. Yeah. Well, you have these other recordings on the 18th and the 23rd that on the 18th, I was pushing it by trying to have the spiciest thing that I could. Then I took a month break. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how I wonder if it's like a lack of being acclimatized, but I took a very mild dose. I took a half dose today. I actually diluted it in twice the normal water and I still had one of the strongest responses I've had so far. So that kind of intrigues me. Um, there are biological processes that are sort of, um, the more frequently you administer the spicy food, the less of a response you have. And so in that case, the hypothesis would be, well, it's because I took a month off, I didn't have anything spicy. So my body went wow, wow, we was as soon as I had something spicy and, and we had a really strong response in the EEG. Okay, so, but the other way you could kind of look at it is, you know, is there also even a cumulative effect? Because uh, the orange and the blue, you know, those were sort of my first times having spicy stuff kind of ever or really wasn't doing it that way before. Um, so if there's sort of an initial response, I would expect to see it in the orange, but the stuff from six weeks ago is actually pretty minor. So I think it's cool to look at a chart like this over a six week span and you go, wow, my response to a stimulus changes quite a bit. And yet, I don't know, I, I would somehow think that it would be more consistent. So I thought this was neat. Of course, there's gonna be variations in recordings and the electrode fit and so on. And this is why it's good to do these. But yeah, I just thought it's kind of fascinating how depending on how you do the chart axis, right? When you do three experiments, it, it definitely tells you one story. You do a few more, and now your data looks completely different. You're like, what the heck? So yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, let's look at the theta. And again, you know, pretty clear responses on the theta. I actually like the consistency here. In every case here, you can see that this is where the onset starts, and there's a very clear shift. And then the responses differ. 
But you do actually see this interesting theta oscillation in, in several of the recordings, right? The purple, the green, and the gray, they all show this sort of cycling um, up and down. The beta, for instance, seems to show a more gradual. So let's see, uh, alpha. I don't think the alpha response is as good, but on the gray day, I would say we saw an alpha response. So that one is the outlier. Beta. Beta and gamma, I think, are the two responses that do come through the clearest, at least on my data, in the sense that the bands are pretty quiet and the stimulus really shifts them upwards. So, yeah, here is the beta response. And I mean, to me, that's... Yeah, there's the before, and then there's the after, and it's, it's pretty sweet. Um, and here is the gamma. And again, we have kind of a more spread response, but it's pretty dang clear. So I would like to thank uh, John Griffiths for contributing his expertise on this. I would like to thank Jaden for suggesting uh, doing this experiment with EEG. I would like to thank Ryan for participating in all our calls and doing the EEG experiment collection a while back. And I would like to thank Richard for submitting his data and a few other people that also uploaded and submitted their data on GitHub. So thank you for contributing to this effort. Um, I think that this is worth rerunning with a little bit more rigorous controls and a little bit more specific on the devices that we do. But yeah, I think that would be really cool. So if if you happen to be watching and you're like, hey, I'm yeah, college, I'd like to do one of these experiments. I'd like to do a student club. I'd like to whatever. Please feel free to reach out to us. We've got the GitHub available. Uh, happy to share the expertise or the tools for how to do this. And we would love to see you try to replicate the experiment. It's pretty easy and it's pretty fun. Um, well, if you find administering spicy food to yourself fun, you'll find this experiment interesting. So any questions on the data, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so that we can talk. Cool. So yeah, that's I think pretty much it for tonight. I, or, I mean, whatever. Happy to chat about topics, have any discussions, whatever. But in terms of the presentations, I mean, it was super cool. We covered the VR stuff. Thank you again, Ryan, for, for you know, it's always wonderful because I'm pretty confident that, that we have the straight answer after talking to you. Um, so excited with how the spicy challenge worked out. And it's neat to see all the advances. I mean, these new VR devices are ready to go. You know, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of multi-sensor devices in people's homes within a year or two. That is amazing. That is really, really, really amazing. And uh, uh, it's wonderful. I think um, I'm, I've loved lab research and, and all those things, but yeah, you're talking 20 to maybe a hundred subjects for most studies. And so, yeah, this is, this is going to be great. Yeah, that it's going to be cool. I mean, I depending on the price point, these devices hit like I'm wondering how many of these HP is going to sell. This, this they could sell a lot, but it I it's going to be interesting to find out. Um, in some of the larger game design, um, like field studies, how many people are interested in developing for this? I don't know if this has been added to any of those reports, but like when you go to GDC, they send you a document to fill out about what games you want to make and what hardware you want. And um, it's one of the most he heavily filled out, like, game design um, documents, or not game design document, game design um, surveys in the world. It has typically, like, 50,000 responses every year. Um, and VR, up until recently, I think VR only usually had something like 30% interest, but it's 
it's jumped up heavily. And I don't know if they did the last time I filled it out, but I, of course, said VR for a lot of things, and I have a lot of friends who did as well. But it would be nice to know if devs are interested in this stuff or if they're aware of it, because a lot of times general game devs might not be fully aware of all the um, technology that's coming out. They're usually just working on games and sometimes they're working on games on really old hardware. Like, stuff that's currently coming out often is using three or four year old versions of Unity or Unreal. Um, so, it it's going to be a while before we see many games taking it or experiences taking advantage of this stuff but this this might be the first time that we get anything other than heart rate tracking into the mainstream like apple watches got that into the mainstream quite a bit i mean i can't remember how many Apple Watches are out there or smart mm -hmm. watches, but we are talking there's at least a few million minimum, probably tens of millions at this point. And that got heart rate into the mainstream. But when we have eye tracking heart rate at some point soon, maybe even EG, this it's going to create an amount of data that will hopefully be accurate enough that scientists can use it to reveal new things about um, human, like how we process information, how humans react to certain stimulus, all of that sort of stuff. It's going to be really cool. Um, but... <laughs> Also, I'd love to do the spicy challenge with the VR headset because Ooh. there, there okay. have been on. studies on food while in VR such that eating food while in VR changes how food tastes. Because if you're seeing something that looks very different than what you're about to taste, it it can create a really weird cognitive thing, but Wait, no one's that... added EG to that. It, now, is that a pleasant uh, sensation or an unpleasant sensation when you're referring to the taste thing? It it can be either. So it's okay. like, can you make something that looks terrible, but it like so in VR you can make it look like anything, um, but okay, because you, you are controlling one of their senses or multiple of their senses, you can create a more tailored experience for the food. Like, food engages a lot of senses. There have been stu gastronomic studies on how, like, even sound can affect how something tastes. Like, it's there's really weird studies on how perception of taste changes with regards to your other senses. Like, taste and smell, those are pretty easy to understand. But visuals w can be a lot. Like, you can make food that looks good enough to trigger someone to salivate. That, it gets really cool. So I have two things I want to comment on. The first is, are you familiar with Miracle Berries? Um, which is the fruit that changes the sensation of sour foods to sweet. I, I've had Miracle Berry. Yeah. yeah. It would be interesting to see if you give someone a Miracle Berry, can they figure out what comes after it? You know, because now you've got not only the dissonance of not being able to see the food, but you've got sort of this taste bud modification. I'm yeah. sure that's a worthless experiment, but I, I think mean, it's it, like... Alcohol changes the taste of a food tremendously. Right. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, the shape of the glass changes the taste of the alcohol. Like, there's a reason you get 
different glasses for different types of alcohol. In Japan, they actually proved it does make like a noticeable change in the taste because it, it was really cool and really weird and something I think only Japan could have figured out is they used a wasabi extract thing <laughs> of course. on of a course. piece of paper and like wasabi like this extract um reacts to alcohol um so they put this over different shaped glasses of wine and you could actually see where the alcohol and the aroma came up through the glass mm -hmm. and that showed how and because you usually knows a glass of alcohol beforehand that mm -hmm. that shape will concentrate the scent differently and that scent affects the alcohol enough that the taste changes completely so like drink stuff in the correct like for a, about a thousand years they just kind of were like this will make people buy more wine glasses right and we kind of understand that these taste better in different things and we're just eh. but now there's scientific proof that it does affect change so right. how can visuals like um do that to affect stuff i mean i know i've been meaning to go to uh, i need to make a few cocktails at some point based off some recipes for i've had a few synesthetic cocktail experiences where so, i'm just like what the heck am i having right now <laughs> so if we're just talking about spicy and vr were you suggesting um to have actual spicy while you're wearing vr or were you suggesting to try to simulate eating a spicy food in vr to see if it generates a response the way that a a real obviously it won't be i don't think it would be as strong but it would be interesting i mean i would i don't know what's you your could take do on that both but mm -hmm. so one experiment you could do is where you're eating real things right. is have Things that, like, in VR, when you're eating things, have them look like peppers. Right, right, and exactly. Then, and then you get the sensory it, experience. Yeah, but then have it so that it's... Have them, like, get trained on this. So right, have eat them like eat, a eat pepper the pepper in the or, VR. And in that's VR, it and it mm -hmm. looks like a pepper. Yes. But then, the next time you go to eat a pepper in VR, it's not a pepper. pepper. Right, it's empty. It's not... It's something else that maybe has it's a, a green similar pepper. texture. Maybe it's a green pepper, not a spicy pepper. Yeah, or something like that. And see if you have a similar response or a, like, or does your brain just seeing that pepper immediately try to think you're going to have such and such instead yeah. of something else? I think that would really tell you whether it's a physiological or like a perception type response. Because, yeah, like yeah, I a lot of this like one thing with the way the tests currently done. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if because you're administering the spice, you don't know if you're going to have a base. You know if you're going to have a baseline mm -hmm. response or a spicy response. So you cognitively might be preparing to have the spicy thing and that might change the response right. um enough that um you wouldn't um be able to really prove that you're having a spicy response and it's so, not so just wait, a precognitive about, response so you create this arbitrary timer that picks a random interval of one to 60 seconds. And after that, it's gonna instruct you to take the spicy food. But, so but now you have so now you're anticipating the, 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 the prediction. Yeah, um, you, I think- You have I to think, make it so that there's anticipation exactly. during the baseline as yeah. much as, so you have to have a chance that it will give you a baseline and, and not the spice. So yep. that no matter what, you're, you have the same thought process and right. pre like experience right. cognitive load um for both times 
I mean, we could set something like that up in Unity and VR and freaking noise bridge. That would be oh, so yeah. cool. I would love to see these kinds of experiments. Welcome to the noise bridge, you know, spicy gauntlet or whatever the heck. It'd be I cool. mean, I want to make my salsa and have people have it in VR. I, I really do. I'm ready. I mean, I don't know if I'm ready. But I'm I'm willing to try your salsa. Having or I make this... different heat levels. I make okay. about ten different heat levels of my spicy salsa. Well, so. I guess we'll I'll experiment. I'll see which ones are tolerable, and if I get different responses. You know, one of the cool yeah. things we had wondered at the start whether you could use the response to predict. I can tell you from the amount of variation, I don't think so right now i think you can see that someone's having a response but i don't think you can get that precise you know i give you exactly this much and you you go exactly that much i think there's a lot of variance yeah so, yeah yeah it, that's going to be hard it's like does having twice the heat create twice the response right. probably not mm -mm. It, yeah, it's, it's gonna be tricky it's going to be interesting but yeah i think vr is going to be a lot of fun for interacting with different senses in the future because right. yeah there's you can also put people in a environment that is very different because like there's so much stuff that affects a person's like senses and how they're feeling like Mm -hmm. Eating at a high-end rest, eating really good food at a high-end restaurant with like classical music playing is very different from eating good food at a bar that's blaring music and you can't move because of how many people are there. Yeah, like both Absolutely. of the times, it's good food, but you're you're currently in a different feeling. Like right. all your senses are different going into that environment um yeah it's i i want to ha be tracking a lot of this bio data right. through different experiences environments and luckily now we can stimulate or simulate a lot of different environments yes. and experiences mm -hmm. and have at least a similar cognitive response there's been a few small studies about like is a vr place does that cause some of the same feelings as a real place so like if you're in a crowded room in vr does that feel the same as a real crowded room mm -hmm. and some of the times it seems like people say they feel the same that's another thing that could be interesting to test using eg or cognitive load is is the you uh like i know dna lounge in san francisco they have a 3d model in vr noise right. bridge has a 3d model of our space oh, in vr like in, like in vr chat or something or yeah yeah okay. or we have multiple in web vr vr chat all right, space and stuff right. so you could simulate they, sadly, since we moved, we don't have a one-to-one -one perfect copy where we could have you go through an experience in the real world, go through in this same experience in the virtual world, and see if you have the same cognitive load. I have the... I found one from August 2020, Mad Gin, but I'm sure that's not, like, super complete. I'll put it in chat, but it is... Oh, a, yeah, that's one of them. So that's using, so we have three different 3D scans of noise mm -hmm. bridge. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is the good one. This is um, the one I helped get um, because, yeah, noise bridge, um, we, yeah, we have the Janus version, VR chat. Um, this is a different one than um but could we have this is someone else uploaded and fixed these ones up right, um right. but this is the model that we have of the old space and it is a really cool model this is um, great man i um I, i'm gonna have to check that out 
believe it or not, I'm behind the the eight ball and the VR stuff because the Quest Two didn't interest me just because of the ecosystem and Facebook. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to everyone on Facebook who's not watching this, but um, yeah, like uh, they're getting so much traction. I've heard so many good things about the Quest Pro. Um, it just seems like. And they've sold millions and millions and millions. Um, so that's amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm also, I'm interested in the HP, obviously for the for the eye tracking and then whatever, but certainly I'm gonna be running stuff low resolution, and, you know, it's, it's I, I, I don't have the horsepower for it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah, I also want to see this question that, Ibrahim. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Let me get to Ibrahim's question. Or if do you want to take it first? You want me to chime in? Uh, I a little bit of it, like the for it, sir. trauma stuff. So the like to come out of trauma like that. Um, I don't know if that's exactly the way to put it like it's since usually it like getting over a trauma or getting through a trauma mm -hmm. is a very long process but there have but also vr and the digital world can create new types of trauma or trigger traumas like there's been a few discussions at length that I've had with different VR developers about the danger of inducing trauma in mm -hmm. VR mm -hmm. because of how immersive it is. You could theoretically create PTSD in VR just as much as you could treat it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, so, it's, it's powerfully immersive, yeah. both in the positive and in the negative. Yeah. And so you can use that immersion to sort of re-experience. Negative experiences yeah. maybe change the interpretation. But Yeah, yeah. But addiction and stuff like it, that's a kind of a smart way to go about it is that you theoretically could, like how we were talking about how you can have real world things and if you are experiencing them in VR, you'll have a changed perception. So theoretically, you could like be drinking in VR and in real life, you're drinking water and you might slowly be able to get over an alcohol addiction. I, I think there's plans for a lot of studies like that with different narcotics and stuff like that is using VR as a simulation of whatever you are addicted to and slowly trying to get you out of it. But the thing is, then you could be addicted to drinking in VR, right. which it's like, there's a lot of interesting things that um, VR and these different immersive experiences are going to allow, but also might cause. Like, there's been not as much study into can VR cause PTSD or how much. But the one thing we do know is that video games, whether they're VR or not, have the same ability of addiction as any form of drug. And true. there's That's actually... Untrue been some things like loot boxes are classified as gambling because they work pretty much and as gambling and um it's actually scary how much more efficient video games are at getting people to spend money than gambling is um it's um i mean now a few years ago, I read an article about how the gambling industry is going to be putting like $50 billion over the next decade to create skill-based um, slot machines and gambling machines that specifically mimic the methodologies that 
video games use to get their users addicted. And that's pretty scary. I have a slightly different take on the on Abraham's question. Maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding or, yeah. it or, or something like that. But I think I think he's interested in, in in exploring these things. And I would definitely say that the promise of VR for therapy applications is really, really big. Yeah. Um, there's going to be lots of treatments. There's going to be lots of counselors. There's going to be lots of things using it. And I have a personal speculation that you're going to eventually come into like these guided experiences where you hire like a VR tour guide and maybe they take you to a few places where, you know, they know that you're going to have a good time or maybe they even curate some of these places to make sure that they're safe for you and, you know, this and that. And I think that there's just so many, I could easily see like a mood counselor or, or someone that is there to help you evoke the the type of experience that you'd like to have in VR, whether it be intense, like some of the experiences Ryan's talking about, which can definitely help with some of these, these deep traumas. Maybe you want a relaxing experience. Maybe you just want to be at a picnic field for 15 minutes because you're stuck in your office and you've got a half hour between meetings and you just want to like, you know, change the thing. So I think, I think that VR, what it kind of does is give you a, a system of measurement that you trust in someone's house. And, and that's been hard to mix because you can have systems of measurements that you trust in your lab and you can have stuff in people's house, but you can't, you can't do both. Well, with VR, it's self-contained, it's self-enclosed, you know how they're wearing it, you know what they're doing, so you can trust it. Like, you know, if the sensor is working properly and if it's fitting properly, we know what data it's collecting. So yeah. I think I think that that honestly, and emotional NFT, I'm not even, I think that that makes sense to me in the sense of you you buy the experience that you want to have and some people are facilitators that can actually help you do that. So if you want to be scared, you want to be relaxed, you want to be happy, you want to be sad, you want them to show you the most depressing footage of some civil war, or you want them to, you know, evoke the, you want to show like human space flight with the recent, you know, um, SpaceX inspiration mission, which I just found it incredible. I mean, I watched that, I'm sorry, but I did watch that thing and I was just amazed in my lifetime I got to witness tourists buy a seat on a freaking rocket and spend three days in orbit. That is so cool. I'm sorry. I just think that's awesome. All right, were you excited by seeing that, Ryan? I mean, I didn't really watch it, but like, I like right now, I have different thoughts about like space tourism and a lot of the stuff just because of how much certain aspects of it are overhyped and under-researched. Like, sure. the whole idea of going to Mars is actually a moot point because scientists will not allow you to go to Mars till they understand more about Mars, which I think makes sense. And it's also stupid to try to terraform Mars when we can't fix our own planet. But all right, you're definitely the VR pessimist and the space exploration pessimist. So we definitely all right, I love space, but we're doing it really inefficiently and we're trying to go way too fast at it. Like, I don't care if people get to Mars by the time I'm dead. I just want them. The people who go do not have like Mars become screwed up or design that situation wrong like right. we should if we're planning to terraform mars in the next thousand years our first settlement shouldn't be in the bottom of what will be the ocean like was... we have a lot of questions we still need to answer before we think about any long-term human space exploration of which very few have even been talked about at NASA or SpaceX. Like, it's okay, cool, we though. We but... won't have the next SpaceX launch party at Noisebridge. <laughs> we'll, have it, we'll have it at the bar next door. And then <laughs> over beer, 
I I hope to hear even more. No, no, seriously, I I get what you're saying, and I totally agree. I was just excited that someone other than NASA and someone other than um, Bezos or rich Russia, Russia is the only other one really that or China. But wow, here was a regular company, and they'll they'll fly you if your money's green. And I thought that was cool. Yeah, but it's also it's money. Like these weren't regular tourists. These were people who could have built their own rockets if they felt like it. They yeah, just decided like, to use someone else's. Sure, yeah. I think this is a good first step, though, because if you're talking about quantity, like if the, uh, if all those people built their own rockets, you know, maybe you would get four people in space. But now you're talking like a pretty regular. I'm just excited about the scale. You know, you look at the production, you look at the factories, you look at the numbers, and it's that volume. But I, I get that you have the other but side of the But it's incredibly point. unsustainable. Sending a single rocket in space is generally very unsustainable. And the idea of okay, like okay. things like <laughs> send, replacing airplanes with r rockets for long-distance travel is, by and large, going against everything in the terms of making things more sustainable. There's no possible way to make a sustainable rocket currently that emits less than an airplane. Sure. Um, if you consider how there are some electric airplanes on the very near horizon mm -hmm. and hydrogen planes, but it's like rockets are cool. And we do need more of them, but there's a lot of stuff we need to put in space in the next couple decades to help us understand our planet and improve, like, communication, science, all that. But mm -hmm. I, I still think, like, the amount of effort I see them spending there probably could have helped that money and the amount of effort they've done to put those people in space probably could have cured a single disease, like a single small scale disease. Like, same with like, I look at how we've had this massive COVID response. What if every two years, the entire world scientific community decides on a disease or virus and literally the entire world puts all its effort into eradicating that thing mm -hmm. we'd actually make a lot of headway on a lot of diseases really quickly but generally mm -hmm. everyone cares about competition and not actually helping people well from my perspective i can certainly understand that you you're largely negative on the the total cost of of space flight um i'm excited that nasa seems to be scaling up their human oh, research into space that's flight. Good. i'm excited oh, that they've yeah. done that program with like baylor through through that and there's just going to be so many more astronauts and that we're getting data on and that like have these devices and so you know i i really just see this as like a really good expansion but i totally get that to you that you know there's so many externalities that it just you know, isn't worth it overall so so i or totally no it's that. worth it just not right now in a hundred years sure i think this is what people should be focusing on but not right now yeah. it's like i'm not i love the technology i love the science behind it but mm -hmm. i just don't think it's in the right place for mm -hmm. what else needs to be done that is much more critical to everyone like i i do think though like having more astronauts that's going to be a medical field day understanding mm -hmm. human bodies in b both low gravity but also just understanding just the amount of human body stuff we learned through the ISS has oh, been yeah. tremendous. Absolutely. And but also currently all astronauts are like they are the perfect person. Yeah, they're super like, healthy, right? It's it's like you wouldn't why would you bother going yeah. through putting someone through years of training if they weren't as fit as possible? Yeah, that's exactly so what I mean. Having, that's true for Russia. That's true for China. Yeah. That's true for the United States. And so, yeah. 
to me like, so, hey, regular people. Yeah, so understanding how the human body work, how more human body types work in yeah. these different environments, including acceleration, low gravity, that stuff is going to be a big deal because right now we also oh same with a lot of studies that are still being done not having consumer devices limits you to a very small subset of types of people generally you need right now the only people who can buy consumer like health related hardware are people that have enough extra income to buy these things who already know that it will benefit them and all these other things that severely limits the possible user base. So having things like these um, eye trackers, heart rate and stuff be designed into something that is a general consumer device in the same way like a heart rate tracker being designed into a watch is better than making a good heart rate tracker because of the amount of users you now will get that would never buy a heart rate tracker. Um, like, sadly, I think the price will be still very expensive for the, um, like, Gallia and all that. So where it's going to be a while before general users or a, a diverse set of the world's population gets anywhere near close to un having this hardware. I mean, you still can't get VR headsets in a large number of countries around the world. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm interested if they had any sensor data for those four people that went up. I, they haven't said anything um, in terms of like, they didn't mention wearing anything that I'm aware of. Um, I would imagine people would bring their Fitbit with them. Uh, but yeah, it's I'm, I think it's well, maybe it just didn't come up, or maybe it's not the kind of information SpaceX would tend to disclose. But I'm actually quite interested. Did they instrument the four people that went up, and how much? Um, because you can, I mean, whatever. You, you have some sensors in the device, but uh, but ultimately, you know, are they wearing anything? So that's kind of kind of interesting. I'm intrigued to see where that goes. Well, folks, I think we're actually reaching the three hour mark. How about that? Time flies when you're having fun looking at spicy data, or maybe just when you're looking at spicy data. Anyway. Um, I think we're pretty much ready to wrap it up. Um, we got a few minutes left for any closing remarks, shout outs, radio requests. I'm just kidding. This is the Casey Kasem Act for anyone who knows who that is. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. But this was a wonderful hack night. I mean, it was great to see so many new people. It was great to have so many questions. Ryan, thank you. We got to chat about VR and I am so excited about that HP. I mean, it, it really, uh, I think that that's going to be a big shift and i think that's cool that it's coming in a month i mean really really, really i exciting. mean you can get it or it's like the current shipping date is uh next wednesday wow okay well, like it if it i posted a link to the store page yeah you did um, scroll up yeah uh, by shopping. the way, for anyone worried about the links, the webinar link will be up for a while after, and it'll have the chat and the recording, and it's also all on YouTube. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, the it says ships by nine twenty eight twenty twenty one. So wow. So yeah, it's coming real soon and... one week yeah well i'll need a little more time but holy moly i hope some people post videos or get some hardware yeah i'm excited yeah. to check that i out. mean like i have the hp reverb g2 the regular one right, the um one. because i was interested in getting and checking out the base hardware before i 
might spend money on that or right, see if I can do an exchange for it. Right. Um, but yeah, it's the getting this. I, I wonder, I need to find out if I know anyone who already has the hardware mm -hmm. and is going to be developing on it. Right. Um, because yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting how much they use these actual parts of it. Like, the dynamic gameplay adjustment, I do feel that's going to be the main early use case. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, and, Alex Peak. you think yeah. he's going to be looking at one of these, or...? I, I'll talk with him about it. Um, Thanks, Ibrahim. Great to have you. Yeah. See you next week. Or see you whenever. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, I'd be interested to get his take on it. I mean, whatever. Anyone's yeah. take on it. But it'd be cool if there was one in Noisebridge. Maybe that's something we can try to like facilitate for. Yeah. I, that'd be cool. I've been... I have before tried to reach out to HP. I need to find the email. Like... It's hard to reach out to HP, or uh, there's a lot of companies that are hard to reach out to, but we do have the funds at Noisebridge to possibly get one if people are interested. Um, but Maybe we can even get one donated or something. Yeah, yeah. It's trying to figure out who would donate one. Um, or if um, we can get a grant together. Like, I've applied for VR hardware um, grants of once before, but I think I need to look around, do another one. Um, because, yeah, our current headset's pretty old, and we do need more... Um, headsets to be able to develop and test right. certain things um but also we need a more powerful computer to run this headset yep, the whole setup yeah uh, yeah all right well i think this was phenomenal thank you everyone for showing up ryan it was wonderful chatting with you um i think we will be back next week and i'm looking forward to uh, sharing some more data looking at some more analysis if I have the opportunity, I'm going to try to collect um, like two experiments of spicy that's like low intensity, two experiments of spicy that's high intensity, maybe three, but we'll see if I have time. Also, I'm worried about like a memory effect. Anyway, we'll have some more spicy data. We're not quite done with it. And uh, we'll talk about more VR. We'll celebrate the HP release. We'll talk about neuroscience. It's going to be lovely. All right, everyone.